I am Hippolyta. I am Hippolyta! <laughs> Drop it. Duncan and both come correct. This show's current. What are you trying to say? Yeah. Know, no, I we're... Know, I'm hip. I know more I'm with shit. it. Yes. <laughs> ducker, 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 ducker. Is, is just making that joke yes. incredibly it, unhip. Like, that that already says, like, you were way yeah, too you, old to be doing Yeah, anything. you've you've dated yourself 20 years or something. <laughs> but maybe plus. I think Austin Powers was the late 90s. Yeah, that yeah. feels right. I don't know. It was a yeah. dark time, Duncan. <laughs> it was a dark time. <laughs> yeah, and there was that. And some some people would argue it was a simpler time. Like he hadn't made the love guru yet, so he wasn't toxic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, right, right. Uh, he hadn't completely shit the bed cinematically yet, but yeah, he was on know. his way. <laughs> well, it, the thing is, Mike Myers never changed. It, no, it's no. just yeah, that the rest right. of the world moved on, and he was like, yeah. "Hey, what about farts and me making funny faces?" And they're like, "Yeah, we're good." Which is weird because like Eddie Murphy hasn't changed, and that's now back. Right, but Eddie Murphy was like when he was doing raw. Oh, Eddie Murphy's and stuff a, like, like that. yeah, right. That's... Eddie Murphy's a different level to begin with. So right. I just want to stress to anyone that might be listening to this preamble of Bo puts it in. I am not saying that Mike <laughs> Mike Myers. Is on the same comedic genius level as Eddie Murphy. That's totally that what is, I heard. That is a fool's errand. Um, what I'm saying is that he was ostracized for quite a while, but sometimes all you got to do is sit back, relax in your millions, mm-hmm. um, and then and then the world will come to you, which is what is done with Eddie Murphy. And I'll tell you right now, Bo Ransdell, I'm looking forward to that coming to America too, even though I think the first one is like comedic genius. I want to see it because I want to see more Eddie Murphy. That Dolomite movie was straight up fucking amazing. So, uh, I am Bo Ranstall. That's Duncan McLeish. This is Duncan <laughs> and Bo Come Correct, a.k.a. Duncan and Bo Go to Lovecraft Country. Duncan, here's why I agree with you about this Eddie Ooh. Murphy thing. I had, I had to get the, all that out of the way. Um, <laughs> we got. We, I mean, it's kind of a show. So, mm. <laughs> kind Allegedly. Of, allegedly. <laughs> I, I think you're right, and I think the thing I love most about Eddie Murphy now is when you see him in interviews, and when people ask, like, what were you doing the last 15 years? And he was like, I did nothing. I was just, yeah. I was sitting around, I was hanging out with my kids, watching them grow up, they had kids of their own, I didn't do shit, I, I cashed some checks, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, and hung out with my family, that's all I did, and like, he talks about how his home, his and his wife's home, Uh, became a hub for all their family like all their kids and their families kind of came through there just Mm -hmm. as a matter of course like you know everybody was kind of always around and i mean that sounds like heaven so yeah that's what if that's not what you want if that's not what the goal is to be in a position where you're financially secure enough that you can take care of your kids and your kids kids and your kids, 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 you know what I mean? In a way where you don't have to worry, you don't have to stress about work or anything like that. You can just sit back and enjoy the time with the people that you love the most. If that is not the dream, then why are we here? <laughs> right, and now he's got the itch to kind of act and be creative again. And great. And he seems to be doing great work. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's mm-hmm. the way to do it. He didn't force himself. Like after yeah, a couple of movies bombed, he just kind of stepped back and then... Had, like yeah, lived his life that, and he had that kind of tepid return when he did that tower heist movie yeah it was kind of it was kind of a quasi it was it almost felt like someone impersonating eddie murphy in that movie he's, he's fine and he's funny in it but it's not it's not what i expect or want from him yeah um, and like i say that dolomite movie i think he is flat out amazing in that and the fact that no one well, it's one of these things where it comes to comedies and horror movies that the Academy will never give someone the best actor for a comedic performance or for a horror performance. They just, they just don't do that. Right. Um, and like he, to me, he's he was easily top five, at, you know, acting performances that year um, from a leading male because he's fucking brilliant. At it. And I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm interested. He's done a lot of projects, so I, I can't wait to see them. Did you see the his most recent SNL appearance? Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah it was incredibly like, I, funny. 
Yeah, very, very, almost to the point where I was like that. This guy, it's like when Chappelle does it as well. It's like these guys like disappear for a huge amount of time and they come back. And I love the fact that they're still a bit edgy. Yeah, <laughs> they're still like, like uh, I saw Chappelle's um, post-election kind of like that, and he was doing a whole kind of diatribe about how you know, like essentially um, Middle America, rural America, is now you know. Um, is, is the white ghetto essentially yeah and it's okay chappelle and his people will <laughs> talk you through how to get through that and it's just so like oh, it's so on the edge i mean like and he goes over it a couple of times but not far over it and it's just as you i think comedy like comedy is the last bastion for for that sort of kind of um satire and kind of political commentary to an extent, our social commentary, and um, I think Eddie Murphy's the same. Like I heard him talk, and I was just like, <laughs> he's talking about Bill Crosby. <laughs> it's not funny, but he's like, you know, like um, that that whole thing about Bill Crosby, um, and he's was it Raw? I think it is. He does yeah, the, the impression where he's like, you know, he's American. He, he called dad, Richard Pryor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> shop and have a coke and a smile. Yeah. Um, hey, but, do, do people? Do people laugh when you say the things you say? Yes. Do you get paid when you say the things you say? Yeah. Then you tell Bill Cosby, have Coke and a smile and shut the fuck up. <laughs> the whole idea that Cosby at that time was like America's dad and yeah. Eddie Murphy was the one that was corrupting things. And at that time, Crosby was date raping. And, right. You know, like people was like that. It's, like, it's swung, the pendulum swung so far around that Eddie Murphy's like that. Listen, I mean, if there's one guy here that, you know, can can say that, you know, they didn't do that and he kind of is America's dad, that's me now, motherfucker. And I'm yeah. like, yes. Donkey yes, from right. fucking Shrek is here to tell you Bill Cosby is a piece of shit. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for it. I think the last time I heard because of the recent, I don't know if you know about this, uh, Bo, but uh, cinemas are struggling at the moment. Um, the theatre experience might be uh, might be changed forevermore. Um, but I believe the last I heard was Amazon had acquired coming to America too, and I believe it is going to streaming. So, but I right. cannot fucking wait. Can't wait. Yeah, I you know a uh, conversation for another day, Duncan. But I'm not I'm not the biggest defender of the theatre experience. I think. Um, yeah, I think it has. I, I, I mean, there are certain movies that I equate to enjoying more because of the experience I have vicariously through other people. Yes, like certain horror yes. movies, I think, play a lot better for me in a crowded cinema, even though they don't necessarily impact me on a, a kind of scare level. But I do get a thrill out of other people not knowing the blatantly obvious that every hardcore horror fan knows that the jump scare's coming in three, two, you know, like so it's that sort of thing. And you see people shit themselves, and it's, it is, you know, there's there's a part of that that you get, like, a, a kind of perverse enjoyment out of. I'm also kind of way, though, there are certain movies that I went to see in the cinema that are, you know, absolute works of art that have been ruined by arseholes talking or people on their phones or, you know, you've come to this fucking theatre to watch this movie, sit down, <laughs> have a have a coca smile and shut the fuck up. It's literally what you want to say to these people. It, it, it can be, it can, it can taint the viewing experience. Um, and if there's, there are certain movies that have stuck with me uh, as being negative experiences until I've saw them by myself and then I finally got it or it's, you know, that it's gelled with me a bit better because there's no one there disrupting my viewing. Um, so, yeah, it swings and roundabouts. I think, you not know, once again, conversation for a different show. Yeah. I think next year is, I think there's a whole lot, a whole mess of movies, I believe is the term that we're going to call it. That's a collection of movies, but a whole mess of movies that have been delayed to next year. Um, and I don't think things are going to be ready. Uh, like for for things like March and April, I just at the stage we're at just now, just don't see it. Right? Um, yeah, it feels like it's going to be a May June kind of affair. Like summer, I think yeah. will be big. But but Duncan, you're not gonna you're not gonna lure me with your siren song of, of movie theater discussions. <laughs> yeah, I've We've had got a few lot, drinks, so I, I'm I'm in the mood for a fight. I, I know you're itching for a fight, and I'm not going to give you one. Um, <laughs> 
the, the like the kryptonite to a Scot a Scottish person is is not arguing, right? It's just like yeah, pleasant. I agree. That's why we don't like Americans. Yeah. That's why we don't like Americans. You're too cordial. Um, yeah, that's like, uh, that's what the world sees as American is yeah, so, you, you are. politeness and sophistication, Duncan. I've never like in the few times that I've been to America, but I've been to America five or six times. Um, I've never been to anywhere else on the planet where people have forced a smile and told me that they hoped I had a nice day. Like never on any place sure. on the planet. It's it's yeah. unreal. It's, that's <laughs> it's all the unreal. that's all the simmering anger under the surface. Like you don't know how to read that. But if you're an yeah. American, that that is that is a quiet fuck you. Yeah, I, trust me. Like in Scotland, you just get the fuck you, yeah. and it isn't quiet. <laughs> probably better. Probably better. But it's but, healthier. It's healthier. <laughs> but Duncan, we've got a lot to cover tonight. Mm, two episodes. This puts us, I believe, back in track. Uh, back in track. Um, because we'll have one, <laughs> it's the one more second episode in a row. Uh, every episode from now on, it's our national anthem, um, the, the, the DBCC national anthem, and um, oh yeah, after this episode, the well, the next it's episode, the finale, the, yeah, yeah, the final two, and I am very excited about it because we were going to record two in the previous episode. That mm -hmm. episode is out; people have heard it, they loved it. I'm just going to say, loved that, it. Yes, loved is the word that I imagine that people felt, um, <laughs> but like. I was like, I'd seen episodes what six and seven in prep for that, so I was prep, but the time just got away from us. So I hadn't seen episode eight, and I was high on life for the episode that we hadn't discussed. I was like, so I mean, I'm yeah. going to have to basically edge myself for a week, um, <laughs> like <laughs> to get fucking through this. Uh, and then I sat down to watch episode eight today, and it finished and. I, I just kept, I was like, not only is it all coming together, but by God, I see it every episode. This show is, is just a different level. It's just operating completely. It functions in a completely different level of entertainment, horror, storytelling, acting, um, social commentary. It, it just is it's like sim tracks. We're going to get to it, but episode eight to me, I don't want to jump ahead of things might be my favorite <laughs> like, it yeah. fucking floored it floored me how much they crammed into an hour of television like it, i just like by the end of it i was like we have tied up so many disparate ends that i didn't think would be satisfactorily bought in at this point and they have there's just like every i know where we're going in these last two episodes kind of um and i'm very excited to get there and i'm very excited to talk about them with you my friend bo ransdell Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this too because I agree. I kind of I had the same experience where, and I well not the exact same because I watched uh, obviously the the episode seven for the last episode, which you and I will talk about in a minute. I think mm. both were like this fucking episode. Holy shit! Definitely and, level. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so then I watched the uh, episode eight the the next day after we recorded. And I, I have to admit, initially I was kind of lukewarm on it because I loved the seventh one so much because of mm -hmm. the the wild tone and the imaginative nature of it and the, and so forth. And then when I went back and did notes, I was like, oh, no, I was fucking wrong. This episode rocks. <laughs> like <I've, laughs> Episode eight, Grim, like episode seven is the kind of, at times, very fanciful science fiction weird utopian movie right uh, and that it takes you through it, we'll get to it but the, the visuals and the, the 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 themes and all the rest are on a completely different level to anything you'll see in television it's just the sort of thing it's the sort of thing that if you watch movies like interstellar and stuff like that nolan tries to capture but he's too bleak to get you know what i mean it's you know, like, <laughs> right. you can't, yeah. can't, the do it. fucking coward christopher yeah. nolan duncan doesn't have the balls to do what lovecraft country does i mean essentially like episode seven like t this, the, the second half of episode seven of lovecraft country is like what would happen if um, if they were making Event Horizon on acid, <laughs> like, it's right, just well, like, <laughs> yeah. And but the thing is, though, like, episode eight just like understands that episode seven exists, and then it's like that. Oh, that's right, we're a horror show, 
And then it grounds it with maybe two or three scenes of visually the best horror I've seen on television. Full stop. Like end of. <laughs> I know. Uh, there's a there's a body mo- there's a body kind of breaking apart scene, transformation scene during sex, which is mm, like I can't think of anything even remotely touching that in terms of what I've seen on the TV. It is <laughs> it's, it's fucking crazy. It's good. different level. It's a yeah. different fucking level, and it just found that the whole the whole every episode just manages. It was weird because you said. Like, I don't know if this I probably won't make the show, but you said to me, it was like, yeah, episode eight, you know, it's like, like, fuck you, Jordan Peele. And it kind of is like, almost in every episode, they have a kind of, there's a linchpin idea to something that exists um, in the horror consciousness, whether that's in a movie or fiction or whatever. And their kind of modus operandi is to better it. And they achieve it in every episode, like every single episode. And they are still doing it, and with two episodes left, and my, I don't, I, I don't know if, I, I mean, I, I haven't heard has it been renewed for a season two. I mean, how could it not be, Duncan? Like the, all the money, like like all the money. If I'm HBO, I'm not fucking paying what was a hundred million to get like a reunion of Friends. Fuck that shit. Hundred million, Lovecraft Country, four seasons. Give me it. Yeah. Anything you want to do. And nothing's like, we will censor. Fuck all. Just do it. So what you're doing just now, just keep doing it. Here's more money though. All right. Just keep going. Well, before we get into those episodes, because we're mm-hmm. both just, we're itching. We're, yeah. <laughs> really excited about both of these. Um, <laughs> listeners, first of all, uh, genuinely, thanks for, for uh, listening to the last episode. A bunch of people did. And uh, that's always nice. And uh, I would, uh, I would quote Ooh. Psalms. Mm. Uh, here duncan uh w- which says you don't need another burden come and party with your spirit guide <laughs> and and that is the spirit of the show i think so <laughs> is this is this sums as written by the beastie boys <laughs> uh it's actually cracker but you know Yeah, this couple of homeboys here will keep it real. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do. Oh man, yeah. Thank you for, for joining us. I do feel now that there's a bit of really exciting news out there. We can probably we've been teasing it enough. There's only one episode left. Do we want to tell the listeners out there where we're going next? Yeah, I think. All right. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so here's what's coming in, uh, after we finish Lovecraft Country. Mm-hmm. We're going to take. Uh, a brief detour, and we're going to do uh, Money Plane. Mm-hmm. A Money Plane commentary. Oh, my God. I, I, I keep forgetting of what we're going to do that. I never let fucking Money Plane. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's got to happen. So that's right. That's right around the corner. Mm-hmm. Then following that, we start uh, a new comment. Uh, well, not commentary, but a new recap show. Um, and I don't know what we're going to call it yet. Uh, I guess Duncan and Bo get chilled. Ooh, something like that. Listeners, mm. uh, feel free to, to drop a line either in one of the Facebook groups or, uh, uh Bo at Legion podcasts.com. If you have an idea, but we're going to be doing the series chiller. And the reason is, it's cause I watched two episodes and I was like, this is the <laughs> dumbest shit I ever saw. And then I told Duncan he needed to watch it, and he watched an episode, and he said, "This is the dumbest shit I ever saw." We ought to also, do this. It's, 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 it's so dumb that it has morphed its name in your brain. It's slasher. Slasher. Sorry, not chiller. <laughs> Jesus. That, but slasher. I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. Like the show is that dumb that when you said that, I agreed with you until you said it again, and I was like. That's not the name of the show. So that's how dumb that show is. Yeah. And but all I'm going to say is, Bo, you may have picked a fucking winner here. Not only because the I've only seen one episode and it is, oh my, it is it's, ripe. Mm, it's wow. ripe for the picking. Yeah. I can't wait. I, there's too much, yeah. too many options. Like, I, like yeah. I don't I like did toy, Duncan. <laughs> so like, Do you be I mean? <laughs> No, let's just shut up. So we'll it's too much. But what was the news that dropped? Like, I'm not saying we should do all the three seasons that are out there but... at the moment. However, the fourth season just got some casting news. <laughs> One, there's gonna be a fourth season of this show. After watching the first episode of the first show, I'm surprised as well as second season, I, right? Right. I'm surprised uh, they got through the first. I'm surprised somebody didn't pull the plug and just be like, you get four. 
Wrap it someone up. has someone has some compromising photos or DNA evidence on a fucking black cocktail dress or something fucking we, somewhere. We call that collateral, Duncan. <laughs> yeah, in order to get another. But anyway, season four casting news. I tagged you. Tell the, the the dear listeners out there what has literally made this the best fucking choice long term for us. Oh well, Duncan, uh, David Cronenberg. <laughs> is going to be appearing in season four of slasher i don't know i i assume he's going to be the high school principal oh could you imagine i mean who knows duncan but all i know is that he's in it and his his performances in film whether it be shivers where mm-hmm. he is a lust-filled zombie mm-hmm. uh whether it is jason x <laughs> where he is head of a shadowy program Meant to study Jason Voorhees and his <laughs> apparent immortality. Whether it is Nightbreed, where oh. he plays the greatest character in cinema history. Oh, Dr. Decker is the, still the scariest slasher killer in cinema history, in my opinion. <laughs> Be- best known, Duncan, by the line. He's got a gun! <laughs> so. See if he does that in slasher. Best show ever, Lovecraft Country, GTFO. We've got, we've yeah. got a new, we've got a new show here, and it's it's called Slasher, aka Chiller. We're just gonna call it Chiller, Chiller, uh, Slasher Chiller. Sla- uh, <laughs> and anyway, so th- we're gonna do the first season of that for sure because holy shit, you guys. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> and then we'll kind of see where we are. It might be a thing where like let's. Let's test the waters with with season two and see how it is. Um, and if it's if it's real stupid, then we'll roll with it. But it could be a thing where we we just jump straight to season four. Could, too. could we get Matthew Lillard to to do the the intro saying "slasher chiller, slasher chiller" <laughs> from the screen? <laughs> we, could we get that? That would be like that's all I want. That's that's what in fact that's is. Oh, <laughs> dad's gonna be so mad at me. <laughs> so, that's where we're going next. However, however. We only recorded a week ago. I've seen some stuff. It's not really worth spending any great time when we can come back and talk about it more in depth. Uh, although I did start that Mandalorian that everyone's been talking about, but that's a conversation for a different time. Bo. Yeah. <clears throat> Three episodes in conversation. For, uh, by the time we record, we'll have seen the first season. We have two episodes packed to the fucking gills with chills. I don't know. Um, that was the best I could come up with after a drink. Um, Can it, all right, so let's do, we're, instead of going one good, one bad apiece, yeah. let, yep. let's just, uh, I know you saw Blood Vessel because I listened to that review. <laughs> and you and I, I think, are pretty much on board, although your score yeah, is fucking mind-boggling. Oh, uh, at, at the end, at the, at, you know how my scores work compared to your scores? My scores work purely on a feeling. On cocaine are, and optimism. A feeling... A feeling Cocaine, optimism, and a check from Shudder. That is literally how my reviews work. No, I, I didn't, I didn't dislike the movie. I feel it is a colossal misstep. But I think there are, there's a few things in there that I just wish it had been attributed to a better movie. Yeah, like the 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 prosthetics and the effects of the vampires are fucking bitching. The cinematography really good. The soundtrack really good. The acting for the most part good but it's just the dialogue is fucking awful and someone forgot somewhere down the line that this is vampires on a nazi boat and that by its very definition shouldn't be as serious as the movie we got like yeah, at some point your, movie is cl- was- your movie's called blood vessel and it's about nazi vampires <laughs> the fuck are we doing yeah it's far too serious it takes itself far 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 far, far too serious and as a result of that it's just not a very good film. That coupled with, like I say, a a, a, a bad script, like a, a very bad script. We bring all that, and just maybe not enough vampire action for me overall. So yeah, th- those are negative. But there there was a lot. Of, I just it, my kind of overriding experience at the end of it was that I just felt, you know, if we just like if someone had just taken another run at this, or we'd handed it to a director who dealt with a bit more schlocky material. There, there's a potentially very funny, entertaining movie there. It just it took itself far too seriously. But I didn't dislike it. I got to the end. I liked it. I would have liked it a whole lot better if they'd done other things with it. And I originally was aiming at the two and a half. And on that day, I literally talked myself up to a three. 
like during the day, I was just like, but you like this, Duncan? But you like, remember? Remember, Duncan? Remember? Um, yeah, and yeah, by the end, it was like three. Um, and I kind of stick with that. I'll never watch it again, though. <laughs> like, Certainly not. One, that is a one and done. Um, I will tell you this, though. I will tell Please. you this. I watched... Uh, because yesterday, the day we were recording today is the Saturday the 14th which means yesterday was Friday the 13th but, mm-hmm. and uh, I sat down with that brand new uh, Scream Factory uh, Friday the 13th box set mm-hmm. and I picked a couple of them to watch, I watched part 2 mm-hmm. I watched part 3 I, I'm still confused why I watched part 3 but I watched part 3, uh, part 4 and part 5 Right, so I did that as a run there. So I, mean, I skipped four's out. A great fucking movie. Yeah, five. I, I I I will argue consistently that five is a great movie. Yes, it has some issues. Yes, those issues. Are... Ooh, baby. <laughs> There's a guy singing on the fucking show, right? Yeah, and like a whole scene about a dude having diarrhea on his day because of enchiladas. Yeah, which are are like one of a multitude of fast food. Readily available in the back of his van. Yes. Um, yeah, like, I mean, it's just like, it's just brilliant. Sure. Right. And hashtag Roy is my boy. Right. That's all I'm saying. But, but bringing it back, like, I I forget how long the, the opening is to part two. It's like, been a while two, since I've watched it. Yeah. Part two has a good 10 minutes before we jump into the new characters. So, a good 10 minutes of that girl. Remembering the end of the previous movie, chopping off Mrs. Vorsey's head, uh, walking about her house, opening like, the op- fridge. you know, yeah, opening her fridge. Like, it's about ten minutes, and I, I was kind of thinking to myself, is this like an extended cut or something? And I, I had to actually get Mother Blu-ray and get the other Blu-ray out, um, and and put that in, and it's the same cut that's on that. And now I feel that either there has been a new cut released at some point since things went to digital, you know, to Blu-ray and stuff. That I just, you know, I'm now completely forgetting that that's the new transfer, or or vice versa, that you know I have just conflated the whole beginning of that movie into yeah, she has a very quick dream about chopping that mother's head off, goes to her fridge, opens it, and then gets a nice pick in the head. I I, I completely forgotten about it, but the the kind of big takeaway for me, and I'll hand it across to you to talk about stuff, is that yeah, part three. Is still riddled with issues. One being Shelley. I'm. So, I know people want. No, he's he's lit. He's a he's an abortion of a character. Mm-hmm. And the the biggest mistake in that movie is that he doesn't die more horribly quicker. Like <laughs> that's the biggest mistake of that movie. Also, that the three D gag is is rank. It like, really is offensive by about the five minute mark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, it just is horrible. Yeah. And I imagine that I, I would have felt the same if I'd seen it at the time, even with this new Marvel, which is 3D. Uh, so yeah, part three, like, but yeah, to double down on what you're saying, part four, uh, to me, that's that stacks up there. One of the best slasher movies ever made. Yeah. Like across the board, it gives you absolutely everything you need for a great slasher movie. And having spent the last two years going through the 88 films, Slasher classic, classic in quotation marks, collection, because most of those movies are not slasher movies. And seeing how bad the movies are from the 80s, and bit like much later than when part four came out, and just like infinitely shit. And then coming back to that, it's a movie that is remarkable that it manages to get everything right. Like everything right. So yeah, um, my big re- kind of revelation is that part four is still my favourite Friday uh, <laughs> and probably will be forever. I, I don't think they'll ever do anything that, that best that. But yeah, my, my love for part five endures. That the heart wants what the heart wants, Bo, and that heart wants Demon, uh, it wants little Reggie, mm-hmm. and it wants Roy, and it wants like Vic at the beginning, like taking an axe. Like someone should have taken that axe to Shelley. Build a fucking DeLorean time machine. Go back in time and like get fucking Vic to take out Shelly when he tries one of his fake pranks. That a real fucking axe in his fake scalp forehead. Oh, I feel so good to get it off my chest. Bo Rans, the what about you? What have you been doing? Oh, I hate Shelly too. Um, <laughs> it's what Bondy does, I think, very early in a relationship with yeah. a mutual hatred of that character. Yeah, everyone was like, oh, he gave Jason his mask. And fuck you and fuck that mask. I don't <laughs> yeah, care. Jay- Jason's cool, all that, but 
Shelly, Shelly, like you said, does not die horribly enough. Yeah, and, if the price we had to pay to not have Shelly in the movies anymore is to Jason to remain with a sack head on, I would do that. Happy to watch pay it. Yeah, yeah, that price was too high <laughs> for, for the hockey mask. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I on on the on the good front, this is a movie that you talked about last week. But Ooh. I just want to reiterate, Possessor fucking rocks. That movie is all kinds Ooh. of good. Um, Ooh. Ooh. And you see what I mean about being violent. <laughs> yeah, it's it it's it's definitely got a tone. It feels like early David Cronenberg. It mm-hmm. feels you know, weirdly. I got uh, a sense of uh, Beyond the Black Rainbow. Yes, yes, Bo, <laughs> and. Yes. I, I, this all this approval coming from you is throwing me off. Um, but that in in the early like the Cronenberg student films, like mm. about the hypnosis and in institute and shit like that. Yeah, um, that kind of stuff. It, it's got that cold kind of corporate feel. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I think that's intentional. I think you know you and I discussed this offline uh, about. Uh, you know, sort of what the larger themes of the movie are and yeah. of, you know, and, and I think you're absolutely right that much of the movie is about uh, how a corporate uh, lifestyle will consume the individual to the point that like the human relationships in their lives tend to fall away because. Yeah, that's what that's what a corp that's what a corporation wants from its workers. Like fundamentally, it wants very much like a beehive. It just wants drones. It doesn't want drones with personality. Yeah, and it pictures wants pictures of their kids. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it wants to pay as little as possible for as much as it can get. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so there's that element, but there's also, I argue, there is also <laughs> a, a piece of of the main character that is either we're just coming into the story at the point where all of that has been erased anyway, mm-hmm. or there is already like the, the thing Jeffrey Jason Lee says where she's like, Hey, if there's a crack, you're lost, yeah. you know? And I think that crack is that like, she's with her kids and she's like, and her husband. And she's like, this fucking sucks. Like, yeah. You know, I don't know that I like this, this, I don't know yeah. that this is fulfilling. And so the job is like, of course it's not fulfilling. We want more of you. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's also there's there's small details in that movie that I genuinely fucking love. Um, there's like when she first transforms into the guy, one of the first things she does is check to see how big his dick is. Uh-huh. Um, which like that to me is a detail that seems to be missed in a lot of fucking movies. Literally, if I became anyone else than me, the first thing I'm I'm doing, man or woman, is checking to see what I've got. Like that is what, what are you working with? Yeah, exactly. Legitimately, the first thing. Not, you know, like, checking at what I look in the mirror. I'm checking to see what I've got. Uh, male or female, that's what I'm doing. The movie does it, and it does it in a very... It does it a very clinically matter-of-fact sort of way, which... I mean, is like... Like the, 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 we use terms like the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree, or the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and that has never been a truer statement when talking about Brandon Cronenberg, he's he's certainly his <laughs> father's son. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's very exciting to those film fans who are have been craving that kind of next kind of effort into weird sci-fi and horror that you know David Cronenberg's probably never going to do, it. and I would argue he doesn't have to do it um, anymore. He's he's, he's got a, a back catalogue of movies which are rich with some of the best examples of. Uh, cinema in those categories that you can go back and watch anytime you want. But the fact his son's decided that that's the road that he wants to go on. And like I say, second movie's Possessor. That is intimidating as fuck. That's your, that's your second movie. And to me, all I could think about weirdly, well, you're talking about um, a Beyond the Black Rainbow and definitely there are shades of that. But all I want is like a day in the house watching in a dark room beyond the black rainbow possessor daniel isn't real um because i think that works as well there's mm-hmm. a, a weirdness about that one but specifically colors get some fucking mandy in there as well just for the fucking just for shits and giggles and a bit of neon demon you crush that together you are like your brain coming at the end of that is fucked <laughs> yeah yeah in the amount of it. ayahuasca <laughs> 
that comes like if you rent those movies, Amazon just sends you ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> you you appear on some sort of register. I'm not going to tell you which one it is. <laughs> right, but you're going to get some mail from some real interesting people. Yeah, it, it, it appears that user 15743 is trying to attain a different plane of existence. <laughs> yeah, look. <laughs> Through cinema. <laughs> fair warning, 60% cults. 60% of the context is going to be a cult of one form or another. But yeah. 40%... Gonna get you spiritual and 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 perhaps even technological enlightenment. So mm. roll the dice, those I movies, guess. Are those movies all had that weird crossover: cults and Mandy, cults and um, mm-hmm. fuck, uh, cults and Mandy, uh, cults and. There's really extent, there, there's cults in all of them, actually, if you think about it. From out, out with out with Daniel isn't real. Yeah, I think that's all what the other movies have. So, but even then, Daniel isn't real is about escapism from your life, which is also essentially what Possessor is about and beyond the Black Rainbow. Mm-hmm. It's like, so yeah, so many themes, so many avenues to go down. But yeah, if you haven't picked up yet, I think it's safe to say DBCC approved Possessor. Yeah, we're like, this is one of those 100% you, you should see this movie. It will be on both of our top 10 lists at the end of the oh, year. Yeah. It'll be very high on my list. If, if, it's, it's challenging just now. For the top of my list. There's, it really, really, really is. For, for as crazy a year as it's been in the release schedule and all that stuff, there has been some phenomenally strong work to, mm-hmm. to choose from. So, like, yeah, again, an embarrassment of riches this year, uh, as, as with every year. And still still haven't seen St. Maud, Duncan. Yeah, I, d- I, don't, I genuinely don't think you guys are going to get it this year. Um, I know, and that's such sad- a bummer. The sad thing about it is that obviously it has, it's had its cinema run in the UK and that means there will be a physical release probably early next year in the UK and then it'll just get pirated to fuck. Yeah, right, I'll, all just, the I'll, yeah. I'll just import it from yeah. one of the, I mean, the good UK shops. I'll, 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 pay, I'll do my part. I will support yeah. the film. Yeah, but, but it will be. I'll end up. I'll end up on every torrent site out there, and that's that's this that's the sad fact. If I was eight, I know why twenty four is holding it back. But at this point, with the the way things are, I'd be doing everything in my power to get out there and get some money off it. You know, anything like get up on iTunes, get up on Amazon, get up on Google and YouTube and all that. Just get out there, you know, and just accept that you have because they have other movies that were supposed to come out this year that didn't. Um, that was at the Green King. Which looked really fucking interesting. It looked like a horror version of Arthur's Camelot, um, which was also kind of like this uh, touted as a, a kind of weird horror movie, which has just disappeared altogether now. I had the kid from um, uh, a what, the, what was the Danny Boyle uh, Indian movie? Ah, fuck! Won all the awards. The- Oh, uh, Life of Pot? No, that's uh, no, Ang Lee. No, that's Ang Lee. So, yeah, you're in the right kind of sphere because that li- uh, Life of Pot... Slumdog like, Millionaire? You know, Slumdog Millionaire. It's got like, the main kid from that. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, that movie was a while ago. Yeah. I can't. So, I, I know, I, I can't think of the actor's name, but yeah, he's all grown up and has a, been in a bunch of stuff. It's something Patel. I can't remember what his first name is, though. David Patel, maybe? maybe. I thought it was like um, Dash or something, but uh, maybe I'm confusing him with Star Wars characters. I'll, well, get to, I'll get to the bottom of this, but keep going. <laughs> yeah, it's basically it's, it, it looks like a version of Arthur's Camelot, um, and we only got like a couple of teaser trailers. It was supposed to be out in May, and it's now disappeared altogether from any listings. So, uh, like Saint Maud got rescheduled, but you know the Green. I'm sure it's the Green King. I'm sure that's what it's called. The Green um, Knight is the Green Knight is there what that is called. Dev Patel is the actor's name. There we go. Well done. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems uh, interesting. And look, like the trailer for it looked fucking amazing, and that's just vanished as well. So, oh, I suppose the guy who did a ghost story. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh wow. Um, okay. So oh. this is this is his next movie. So, um, and it looked fucking great, and it's just been pulled all together with no kind of you know aiming to release it, and it, like it's just disappeared. So, I need to it for like not a big studio. So it doesn't have the you know the money in the bank that like a Universal or a Disney has to say you know what we'll just not do anything this year. 
<laughs> like, we'll just hold off. Yeah, we'll just write this one off as a loss and then reschedule things and just we'll just move everything back a year on the table and we'll be fine because we have the reserve to that. E24 doesn't really have that, but at the same time, all the more reason to try and get your movies out there in a form that people will pay for rather than the alternative, which we know what that is, which is very much the it will appear and then everyone will you know, fucking stream the fuck out of it and not pay for it. And then as a result, it'll eventually find a physical media release and it'll underperform there because everyone watched it. And it, yeah, it's just, it's depressing. Um, and St. Maud is, I've said it before, say it again, if there is one horror movie that you see this year, it is, well, and you're into that sort of horror movie, um, at St. Maud is really, really rather exceptional for another first time female director. So, yeah, you'll get there. As, as soon as I know when it's getting physic rele uh, physically released in the UK, I will give you the heads up. Um, and I know for a fact that we will have a lot to say about it once you've seen it. Excellent. Um, all right, before we move on to the episodes, Duncan, mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of questions. First one's a, a quickie. Oh, I love a quickie. Uh, from I know you do. From Xavier <laughs> Wes, uh, who says, Mr. Watson and Jerry Herring are both going to be murdered by Dave Z. Oh no! And you can only save one. Oh, don't do this to me. Who do you save? Don't do this. To, I, I, you know what I do? I put, I sacrifice myself so the two of them can live. I know it's not an option, but that's the only way I could live with myself by dying. All right. Well, uh, there is one cowardly response. The... I can't like like, uh, like we both know and love Jerry Herring, right? Yes. Like, he's 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 an infectious force to be reckoned with. The podcasting world could not do without Mr. Watson. I think I think he is a keen, sharp, uh, and very relative intellect that is as much needed uh, in the the insane world that we live in just now when it comes to to movie reviews. So yeah, I don't want to choose between them. So I do. I throw myself upon thy sword um, to to save them both. I uh, I take out Dave Z. <laughs> I didn't know that was that. Oh, I yeah, shrewd Boran's done. Uh -huh. eh? All right, so <laughs> moving on. Ramman asks, what would you rather see in 2021? A new John Carpenter film from Blumhouse or Mike Flanagan's shark film for A24? Uh, Mike Flanagan's shark film for A24. And trust me, there's no other answer. That should be the answer. I, like, I, John, like John Carpenter coming back to do so. Like I've seen John Carpenter come back. Unless John, if it was John Carpenter at his most motivated with his best script coming back with to to do a movie with no studio interference, then you maybe got my you maybe got my intention. But it's going to be compromised. John Carpenter has been away for a long time, and let's be let's be honest. I don't think he really wants to do another movie. I think he talks about it because he's forced on it in the media, but I actually think he wants to do that. I think he's quite happy being a musician now, which is the life he always wanted, weirdly enough. Flanagan doing a shark movie, though, for A24. How could you not want that? It's fucking Mike Flanagan. And sharks. And A24. Yeah, all, all of those things. I agree 100%. Um, I think, I, I think you're right. I think John Carpenter just wants to make music and go on tour and play destiny. And that's and he's fine. Done that. He's done He's done it. He has, listen, there are a few filmmakers that have done as much for the genre as John Carpenter has arguably the, the greatest horror director of all time, arguably made the greatest horror film of all time. And then surrounded it with just the greatest depictions of nihilism ever captured in cinema. Right, he's the, he's the last punk rock director. He's the last guy that can throw up two fingers to the establishment. Why would I want to see him come back and do another movie? You know what I mean? Compared to Mike Flanagan, who, let's be honest right now, I don't understand sports ball vernacular, but his batting average is really good, Bo. Um, yeah, I think he's like, at the top of his game, for sure. Like I, I still think he's got another gear. Like, after seeing we'll Doctor see. Sleep, now, after seeing the extended cut of Doctor Sleep, Bo Ransdell, Give me that in the cinema. What the fuck? Yeah, this, right. This, this, this right? studio shit I'm talking about, where people go, "Well, it's too long. People won't sit there. Who would sit through that?" Yeah. No one. No one fucking showed out to the the Doctor Sleep movie. So you know what I mean? Like, wasn't not nearly enough people showed out to that. So if you, if you're already in this situation where you don't think a lot of people are going, just give us the whole fucking thing. But anyway, I think like after watching that, 
I still think he's got. I I I think he's got another gear somewhere, and I think we're still to see it. But he is a guy who genuinely is fearless. He made a movie which is not only a sequel to The Shining book, but Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, and somehow managed to take two stories which went off in completely different directions and make them feel like one. Yeah. I don't know of any other director that would have the fucking balls to do that and do it as well as he did. So Flanagan to me, oh. To cast Henry Thompson, uh, Thomas, not Thompson, Henry Thomas as Nicholson. Mm. And it works. Like, oh. I, I I think all that stuff works just fine. And Alex Esso as Wendy is sure. maybe the shrewdest, <laughs> the shrewdest bit of casting I have ever fucking seen. Because <laughs> she is... 100% perfect. And if you told me beforehand, I didn't know she was in it. And if you told me that, so she almost, she's like nigh unrecognizable. Yeah. Um, I, if you told me that beforehand, I would have said, uh, maybe Flanagan's maybe losing it a little bit. And now watching, I was like, no, the man's a fucking genius. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He really is. He's, he's, uh, he's maybe the best horror director walking the planet right now. Um, and that, I think you could give him anything there. I think he'd deliver gold from anything right now give him blood vessel and see what happens oh shit if mike <laughs> flanagan did that movie shit blood oh vessel, my god vampire okay. nazis ball on a boat in Look, 1945 you give him that movie and watch the fucking watch watch the horror fans lose their shit i mean look what he did with a limited setting in hush mm. and then you add nazi vampires to that recipe of yeah. just like, oh, let's just create tension in a confined space. Yeah. Oh, oh man. God, that guy's so good. Ocul yeah. I, I still say Oculus won the best horror movies of the past 20 years. And Oculus is brilliant. I mean, that to me is a movie which, like, it's so streamlined. It, like, I think that's maybe, like, like, Doctor Sleep feels like a massive production. But when you jump back from that, all these other movies incredibly streamlined and insula but dealing with huge concepts mm -hmm. and that's what i, I kind of love about them he manages to ground everything through not only his cast and his storytelling but first and foremost his direction um a guy who just like that's like next year when we get to the the teapots uh series on the 2010s i i like flanagan's going to be all over that right from the right from the goal with absentia right through and i you know and and rightly so i think he's one of the the most important voices in the horror cinema right now. And that's like, anything he wants to do. I know he's got his Netflix deal. He's doing stuff with Stephen King, which is great. You know, Stephen King should just keep giving him stuff and they should just keep doing things together. But whenever he decides to go off and do one of his own projects, you know, I'm genuinely excited about that. I now know that you could give him any King thing and he'll do it. And he'll do it really, really, really well. So that's not a test for me anymore. That's just he's a big fan and he's getting the opportunity. Very much like Mick Garris, but just like can direct a movie. I'm like Nick, Mick Garris. Uh, you know what I mean? Mick Garris, if he was wildly talented. <laughs> yeah, if he could, um, could back up what he actually says. Um, but, you know, I know he can do that. So anytime that's mentioned, I get a bit giddy, but I'm not like, oh, you know, I'm not sitting there going, oh, I can't wait to see what Spinny puts on this King Classic because I know he can do it. To me, the exciting news is anytime Mike Flanagan gets attached to something I'm not aware of, or anytime he says he wants to do something, right. because that to me is the the you know that's the point that you should be sitting there going, and like studios should be feeling the same way, like they should be sitting there going, right, Mike Flanagan wants to do this, right? How do we get him into a contract to get that movie out? Yeah, he needs to do like somebody's going to back up a, a truckload of money and give him like Doctor Strange three. Mm. Mm. you know something like yeah. that where he gets his big he gets his big marvel payday yeah uh th speaking which is payday's. fine with me like by all means speaking of payday's yes, Borans, though, uh, let's let's do this and then let's talk about lovecraft country i love how we were like we're going to keep it concise yeah tight, but, and then don't. And get, yeah it never happens and i've uh, been drinking so you can blame me um but right. ben wheatley yes directing the meg too Fucking what? I mean, I, I'm all <laughs> for it. Who comes up with that? Who comes up with Who sits in Hollywood and says, the kill this guy? Yeah, let's get him to direct the Meg 2 with Jason <laughs> Right. What, no, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that one. What else has he done? How about High Rise? Have you seen High Rise? That guy? 
huh, uh, that's not ringing a bell. What about a and field same, in England? Have you <laughs> seen? The same, the same time frame that he's going to be doing that movie, he's going to be doing Tomb Raider 2. Fuck, good job, Ben Wheatley, man. He's earned it, man. He's earned the fucking PD, but... Like, like people were talking about how the Meg, you know, like, they're, they're like, oh, look how he sold out and all the rest of it. And I was like, you know, a Tomb Raider movie with Ben Wheatley directing it? That's interesting to me because that's in the forest. It's fucking weird. You know, you can, like, play with mythologies and, like, make it a bit edgier and all the rest. I'm totally done with that. The Meg thing makes zero fucking sense to me. And then, well, everyone else has been, <laughs> well, everyone else has been fucking around, right? Everyone's been fucking around and all the rest. He has secretly shot a horror movie, which is done. Yeah. Right, and it's it's coming out next year, uh, and it's all set in the woods. You've got me on board. It's got Rhys Shearsmith, who's the guy that does a creepy face in a field in England, coming at the tent mm-hmm. in the main role, and it's about you know the forest trying to consume someone, and uh, but that's like Wheatley's done that. He's done it quickly on the cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will have that movie. I will go and see the fucking Meg too, and scratch my head at, at how this has happened. Uh, and I'll go and see the Tomb Raider movie, albeit I'll have to go and check out what that first Tomb Raider movie looked like. Um, Let me, the only ones I've seen is the Jolie ones. I've never seen any of the... I'll tell you, the one that they did with uh, Alicia Vikander, I think is her yeah. name, or Vikander, um, not terrible, and Walton Goggins is the villain. Oh, that's all I need to know then. And he's really good in it. Uh, <laughs> he's a good at everything, Bo. <laughs> well, because his whole his whole deal, like every vil- every good villain has mm-hmm. that hook that's just like, okay, I totally understand that character now. Yeah. And his deal is he's looking for the, he's been hired to find this artifact. Yeah. But when he was hired to find it, he didn't think it was going to take so goddamn long. <laughs> and he's been in the jungle for a long time. And all he wants to do is go home, and mm-hmm. he's sick of uh, uh, Laura Croft's shit and keeping <laughs> him from this artifact so he can get the fuck home. He doesn't care about the artifact, doesn't care at, like what, what the, the business who hired him is going to do with it, just wants to do his job and go the fuck home. And He's the, he's the Wilford Brimley of villains. He, yeah, he's, <laughs> God damn it, Laura Croft out here with a bunch of goddamn bow and arrow. <laughs> Shooting red barrels, making everything blow up, knocking men off goddamn rope bridges and shit. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I'm all right. <laughs> I just want to go home. He's doing a sequel to that, Wheatley's. And like, so, yeah, yeah, it's great to see him arrive at that station and all that. I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see the reaction if those movies flop. And who's who's blamed? Because if you're blaming <laughs> if you're blaming Ben Wheatley, the kill list and a field in England guy for not making your Meg Two movie <laughs> successful, um, yeah, I, I can't actually. Like, but yeah, weird. What, oh, so many amazing directors just now that like there's yeah, I can't wait to see where they all go. Uh, and speaking of this is what the call segue, ladies and gents. And I shouldn't have same posted, but speaking of amazing voices and mm. talents. Just being able to do whatever the fuck they want. Let's turn our attention to some Lovecraft Country. It, if I may, right before <gasps> we're we're gonna jump Are in. You derailing my segue. No, no, I I kind of am because I have a proposal for Meg Two by Ben Wheatley, <laughs> and I think once I tell you, you're gonna love it. <laughs> does does the shark go into a tent and come out with? <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I, I've, with a maniacal smile while seventy psychedelic plays in the background. La, la, la. <laughs> Look, it's I've already shot. used that joke, Duncan. This is a whole new dumb idea. <laughs> <laughs> I gave I gave you the B material dumb idea on Facebook. You've been, yeah. been holding on to that A material where it drop it. I'm sandbagging the stupid, Duncan. Is what I'm doing. I'm sandbagging the stupid. Oh, that's a t-shirt. Um, the book, correct. Sandbagging the stupid since 2014. Yeah, right. So uh, it, it's all done from the point of view of the shark. Mm-hmm. It is 80% free of dialogue. The only dialogue <laughs> you hear are the screams and shouts of horror. As it appears and eats shit, and then eventually somebody kills it, and you're mm. just as surprised as the fucking shark is when it happens. 
Yeah, they, they kill it and they eat his brain and then the shark possesses that person which then continues the rampage. Oh, that's pretty good. Like a Meg oh, X no. or a, a yeah. Meg Goes to Hell. <laughs> yeah, a Meg Possession movie. A lot of Friday the 13th. I, by the way, I did watch Friday the 13th uh, last night. Um, the original? The, the OG Friday the 13th had been a while it's since. It's a real fucking good movie. Real it is a really good, good fucking movie. I, I yeah. had a good time with it. Um, it does It does force you to kind of <laughs> put your your expectations of the ability of a, a frail old woman to throw people through windows though <laughs> i what i like most about <laughs> fucking robocop some out windows <laughs> yeah well you know pamela Voorhees is thick she's got a lot of core strength it's like that bit where like robocop appears like the first appearance of robocop where he's in <laughs> He's in the fucking the petrol station, and the guy goes running past him and puts his arm out. And the next thing he sees the guy through the window. That's Pamela Voorhees. Yeah, I can hear him now. Freeze, creep. <laughs> mommy, mommy, freeze, creep. He would say. <laughs> um. All right, but enough of that. Yes. <laughs> Remember when you were segueing that? So it's yes. episode seven. Oh <laughs> man, I don't know how we're going to be able to. Do- well, it's just going to get weirder from here. So strap yourselves in, folks. Yeah, and the episode is entitled "I Am." Mm. I am what I am. No, that was the last episode. That was the musical episode. Get the fuck. Yes. Right, sorry. There we go. So we we open on Hippolyta because mm-hmm. remember the last episode was all a Gia origin story. Yeah, just at the like the, the once again the classic way of Lovecraft Country doing things. End of episode four, she's making a fucking beeline to Arkham, and we're gonna we're gonna sort some shit out, Boranzel. That's what we're gonna do right now up in this bitch. And it was like that. Whoa, 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 whoa! Whole episode dedicated to uh, to Korea, <laughs> and then we'll come back to it. Maybe you won't know when until now. Yeah, and and so we see her going through some notes. Uh, and and examining this orrery, mm, orrery, orrery, <laughs> it's a rural orrery, <laughs> and and then it goes uh, three days ago. Mm-hmm. All right, and Hippolyta is standing in the ruins of the estate in Devon County, and and she sees like this sun symbol that she saw on the orrery, mm, and orrery. orrery. <laughs> And then she also finds a scrap of these comic. Yep. And she's like, well, motherfucker, George was 100% here then. Yeah, so he definitely was here, unlike the story that has been, well, for lack of a better word, peddled to me by the people that came back. Right. My so-called fucking friends mm-hmm. all Nephew, told me. Yeah. Brother-in-law Ugh. and that woman that's just hanging around. Don't know what her relationship is. I think she may be doing things to my nephew. Uh, but I didn't think about stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not where I live. Um, but so uh she they you cut back to her in, in this room with her notes, and she's getting pissed off because she can't figure out the this orrery. Mm-hmm. And she ends up just knocking it off uh the desk and then lying on her bed and just like, God damn it, I can't figure out, kind of talking to George. Who isn't there, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like, George, I can't figure it out. And he's like, well, just just <laughs> use the force, god damn it. And <laughs> A Jedi ghost projection of George. Uh-huh. That's what we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Voiced by Wilford Brimley. That's right. It's like, <laughs> this is the inception of fucking creative combat references here. <laughs> and so... <laughs> She, she when when she sees it from this tilted perspective, she's like, "Wait a second, Eureka! I think I have it." And she ends up like twisting some planets until things click, and then it starts glowing and spinning, and then uh, a key is revealed. Mm-hmm. And on this plate of the orrery, orrery. <laughs> Is <laughs> I mean, sometimes you just forget the vowels and just <laughs> plow ahead. <laughs> it's like a uh, uh, slow down, uh, uh, like a tiger roar. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. That's about... <laughs> this is all stupid. All right. So, <laughs> on the plate, Duncan, it says every beginning is in time and every limit of extension in space. Mm-hmm. And then it has some coordinates below that. And so, we cut away from Hippolyta. Mm-hmm. Because we now know that she has some shit to do. Right. Key. She's got those coordinates. <laughs> yeah, she's got a, somewhere to be. Yeah. And it's Hippolyta with the coordinates and the key in the observatory later on. You got to oh, you got to have <laughs> coordinates. Co- oh god. <laughs> you literally kicked off my watch there. <laughs> my watch <her> says <laughs> Astronomical observatory sites by latitude and longitude, longitude uh, and it's given me a full list of them. You somehow triggered my watch, yeah, to you're... bring up a list of fucking coordinates. And so, Mister McLeish, the missile will be there in forty-five seconds. <laughs> see you see don't you have triggered... time to run. <laughs> 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 see if you've accidentally <laughs> triggered off a nuclear strike from my my Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> like, on, I don't know, let's see, a country that we don't get on with, which is any country in the world, um, <laughs> right. or this stage. Uh, I don't know. I'm blaming you, and I've got recorded evidence of it. Unless you don't post this, you better post this. Oh, th- all this will be edited out. This will be on Patreon. <laughs> you want to know who started the apocalypse? <laughs> Two bucks a month, motherfucker. I know, I know there's no one left to pay that two bucks a month because apocalypse, but it's still there behind a fucking paywall. That's right. Also, uh, who killed Kennedy? <laughs> the The Patreon is a den of secrets, is what I'm saying. Oh, man, there's somewhere out there some fan fiction that reveals that uh, Doc from Back to the Future accidentally killed Kennedy, and I want to see that movie. <laughs> Great Scott! <laughs> Marty, it's your president. Back into the left. Back into the left. (laughs) Great Scott, it's his brains. Back into the left, the future. Uh, That's the name of that series. (laughs) Oh. Oh, Duncan. Kennedy is a national hero. He is. Sorry, I don't know why I'm laughing. I do actually feel a little bit, a little bit queasy about what we've done here, tarnishing the good name of <laughs> President Kennedy. He been I'm Berliner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, always liked a good joke. Um, anyway, so Ruby and Extina are mm. in the the secret basement room that Ruby, you know, was like, "What the fuck is down there?" And yep. it, it turns out what's down there are the vegetative bodies of William and the racist lady that Extina <laughs> has been milking for potions. Oh, I can we use a different one? Oh, well, I mean, that's kind of what's going on. Yeah, just tapping them for potions, <laughs> for blood. And... She's got a different image if she was being milked. And, uh, to be honest with you, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> so, and Ruby is like, you've been lying to me. This all sucks. And, you know, this is all about your revenge for William and, and you're just using me as a pawn. And Extina is like, no, it's way more about like, <laughs> look, my father was the leader Nuh-uh. of this Order of the Ancient Dawn. And I never even lied to you. I mean, look, maybe it was William who said those words, but they were mine. And Ruby's like, I don't know. And she's like, look. You could be super powerful, mm. and all it and and Ruby's like, all right, but you gotta you gotta quit fucking around and stop lying to me and tell me the truth. And uh, Exine is like, well, listen, sister, the truth is, it has to do with missing pages from the book of names and <laughs> your family, and, and and so we that's where we leave them for the time being. <laughs> We'll some... all come back to them at some point. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of Ruby and Extina stuff through these episodes, and I love all of it. I'm here for all. Oh, of all it. of it is the, 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 I've actually like very much moved into the camp of everything with them on the screen is just the best. <laughs> like, right, you know, like their interactions are just br- one in the next episode in particular where we go through a huge gulf of emotions. Yeah, uh, 
kind of horrible, torrid sex scene in the aftermath of it, and it is just primo fucking acting. Like it's just like top level acting across the board. Um, but yeah, they, they are they are, they have proved to be a pure delight in this series. However, as you said, Bo, we're going to move on because we have a lot of story to tell here. So. Yeah, there's there's a lot of 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 plot that we are getting through both of these episodes. Mm-hmm. Well, for half of this episode and then all of the next one. Yeah, but, half of this episode, and then we go into the cosmos. And trust me, you want to be there when we do. Oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> just go ahead and queue up roundabout by yes. We'll we'll get there in a second. And then, so we cut to this dream that of of Hannah fleeing mm. the estate while it's burning down. Like it's the same dream that Atticus has had a number of times. And um, at first, we think it's Atticus that's dreaming it until we realize. Wait a second, Atticus isn't in this dream. Yeah, it's Letty. And then uh, Letty has a pregnant belly that catches fire, which is not yep. what you want to see out of your pregnant bellies as a rule. No, I don't think that's what happens. Like Speaking as a father um, and remembering briefly what it was like when my wife was pregnant, I just can't remember spontaneous combustion happening in or around the gut. I just can't remember that happening. Huh. All right. Well, good to know. Um, and <laughs> I'm calling shenanigans on this one. This Lovecraft Country scene, Bo. Cheers, cheers to Lovecraft Country. <laughs> <laughs> I I I like the fact that like Letty is so pregnant that Attic like she can have Atticus's dreams now. You know? Well, yeah. This is this is the this is the ind- the indicator is that she's now. And we'll get further information on this, but is is that she's with child, and as a result of that, doomed to now carry the fucking weird, weird curse line of dreams of an event that happened generations ago, right? Like and, by proxy. And I like the fact, like we'll get to it here in a second, but I like the fact that the show kind of introduces this idea. Like as soon as her belly catches fire, you're like, eh, baby. And yeah. and I like the fact that within this episode, the show's just like, that's right, baby. <laughs> um, like they don't fuck around with it, which I appreciate. But uh, anyway, so Letty wakes up and goes downstairs to find Atticus downstairs, just staring out the window of the boarding house. Mm-hmm. And then they immediately just start kissing, which I appreciate the fact that, like, okay, they're just a couple now. Yeah, they do. They do, they do things like that. they've they got past that awkwardness, Bo. Yes, they have indeed listened to DBCC advice, and they were fucking mm-hmm. like they should have been. And now that they've done that, they're a couple. That's how things work. Yeah. And I appreciate it. Yes. It is nice to see the progression of this relationship. Mm. And we get a, a ton of info kind of dumped here where Letty says that she's been having these similar dreams to Atticus, but pointedly does not mention the fact that her belly was on fire. Because that's a telltale sign of pregnancy. I don't know if you know about that. Right. Um, <laughs> I ain't going to tell him about my burning belly. And then, <laughs> and then they kind of deduce that Hannah is trying to communicate with them in some way. Mm. And when Letty says, "Yeah, she was holding a the book," they're like, "What if she got out with the like everybody's chasing around for pages?" But what if Han- uh, Hannah got out with the whole book of names? Mm-hmm. And he's like, "Look, I just don't know that much about my mom's side of the family. Not since the ride in Tulsa," he says. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, look, Extina's is going after all these damn pages. We're going to go get the whole damn book. Hashtag end game bull. Mm-hmm. Way, mm-hmm. way to set up a finale. <laughs> and then there's a, a, a really <laughs> fun scene here. I was going to say that's the classic Lovecraft country thing as well. It's like they set up the end of the season in episode seven, they're like, we're not going to touch this now right. <laughs> until episode 10, because that's how we do things. Give you a little taster, and then you wait a couple of episodes, and then we deliver. And trust me, when we deliver, you are hungry enough for it that it will taste like the best food you've ever had. Right. So it's going to, yes. when you see it, it's going to blow your goddamn mind. Trust us. And it will. It will. <laughs> and I, it at will. this stage, <laughs> at this stage, having not seen the last two episodes of the season, I am 100% expecting to come away from this being like, Yep, best show ever. Uh, give all the awards. Um, I'm now dedicating my second child to Lovecraft Country. In fact, uh, my second child will be called either Atticus or Letty. Um, that is my that's my my gift to the show because that is how much they landed to stop the landing. And if my wife's belly doesn't burst into 
spontaneous flames. Um, she's not pregnant, even if she starts the show. Yeah, <laughs> I get refused. <laughs> like, uh, 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 Duncan, uh, uh, I'm pregnant again. Has the belly burst into flames? <laughs> it has not. And you're not pregnant. I'm no doctor, uh, but I know that means you're not pregnant. Yeah. What do you mean you're leaving me? What do you mean you're leaving me? <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Hashtag hot flash. <laughs> Hashtag I'm burning sure belly. I think that's I think that's where the the term hot flash comes from. <laughs> that that's my understanding. But again, yeah. I don't have kids. No, so. and I am no etymologist. <laughs> All right, and <laughs> so what? I don't even know. So there's a <laughs> a scene I really like here, mm-hmm. where Montrose is waking up. And the last time we saw him, there was like the big, uh, you know, celebration, like the big drag show with his, uh, the bartender, Sammy, and mm-hmm. the big kiss and the dancing. And so he wakes Sisters up. Sisters are doing it for themselves. Yeah. I was like, this he was really... getting down and dirty and I loved how happy it was. Yeah. It was really empowering and all that. And then, so Sammy's at his place making breakfast. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of doing some morning chatter, like, hey, you know, uh, you know like, uh, it's the first time that Sammy's been allowed to stay over. Mm-hmm. And Montrose is kind of giving some shit about that of, like, you know, Sammy's in a, a good mood because he let him stay over and they're just kind of ribbing each other a little bit. Yeah, and, he's making them breakfast yeah. as well. And. Then uh, they're they're eating breakfast, and Sammy lets it drop that he ran into uh, somebody on the street and kind of tells him about this exchange that they had, um, just kind of chatting. And Montrose is like, hey, that's my neighbor. Mm-hmm. And starts to get real clammed up. And then he's just like, look at this bacon. <laughs> or actually, according to our show mythology, hey, mister, look at this bacon. <laughs> And these grits are total shit. <laughs> and then Sammy... <laughs> it reminds me of that scene from Naked Gun 33 in a third prison. In the prison. <laughs> and this one here tastes like gruel. And this Chateau Lafitte, 1973, supposed to be served at 19 degrees Celsius. This is more like room temperature. <laughs> So Sammy Duncan is like, uh, yep. what are you going to do? Him out in that. I yeah. love this. He fucking like, listen, every time we get like close and we're, you know, you're about to let yourself go, man, you find every fucking excuse in the book to cast up some sort of wall in front of me. So is it just going to be about breakfast? Is that where we're going to go? And my- <laughs> Yeah. The exchange is him saying, you're going <laughs> to complain the coffee is too wet. And Montreux says, nah. Too much sugar in it. <laughs> it's like the, the best smart ass that's on it. Yeah, and Sammy is like, you know what? You can go be crazy on your own time. I'm out of here. Which, yeah, the man's got the patience of a fucking sphinx. Like, he, yeah, right. Like, hey, if you're going to have a tantrum, I'm just not going to stick around for it. You'll come back later. And then, yep. you know, we'll hash you'll all this spit, out. You, yeah, you'll spit in your dick, shove it up my ass, and then we'll be fine. Right, right. It's, that you know. happened in the show. Watch the show. Yeah, I like, like being crassy. That happened. It was amazing. It was, yeah. loved it. We fucking bonded. We're closer now as a podcasting couple having watched that scene. It's fucking and, amazing. And discussed it and, and been celebratory of it. Oh, I yeah. Oh, and it's amazing. So Sammy is storming out, and Montrose is like, Wait a second, mister. And <laughs> chases after him and mm. runs right into Letty and Atticus. Oh, no. And Sammy stops for a second. It's just like, oh, y'all yeah. have a good day now. And just kind of strolls <laughs> <Bye>. on. <Yeah. laughs> it sounds like you guys have some things to talk about. And, and Atticus and Montrose really have it out where, you know, yeah. Atticus is accusing him of being gay, which he is. And Montrose is, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's true. Specifically ask him if his mom knew about it. Yeah. And, and Montrose is like, yes, your mother knew. <laughs> and Atticus like storms off and, and, uh, son's impression. I love how Montrose says, 
why y'all come here? Yeah. And it's this like, why, why are you blowing my world up? You yeah. know, it is just this pain. <laughs> like this sucks. Like I, at first I now like the guy that I'm in love with just stormed out of here and I got to apologize for that. Now my son is probably never going to talk to me again. You know, and there's also there's also that part of um where you know, like in the lead up to this, uh, like Sammy's never stayed over. He's never really let himself go that way before because in his head, the repercussions are the very things that are happening right now. Yeah, yeah, he and he's, he's, he, yeah, right. he had that moment of weakness. I would say moment of embracing who you actually are, which is never weakness. It's the greatest fucking courage you can ever have. Um, but that moment of of weakness in his mind, where he allowed some, you know, that, that part of him to actually be part of his life, and the worst things that could have happened in his imagination are now unfolding in front of his face. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, absolutely being punished for doing the the thing that he most dearly wants to do. Yeah, and yeah, and it yeah, it totally blows up. But mm. so, uh, Letty goes chasing after Atticus who's outside just pacing and fuming and um she tells him like look I found out that one side of your mom's side of the family or that uh, one of his mom's friends on mm -hmm. the, on his mom's side of the family survived the Tulsa riots and they have a lead in St. Louis and while she's given him this information, Atticus is just in front of the camera coming to terms with the fact that Montrose's beatings were not about him being soft. You know, he says, like, he always told me he was beating me so that I wasn't soft. Mm -hmm. And all all along, it was him. Yeah. And we've, well, like, we, we spoke about that way, way, way back when I think it was revealed that that might be an issue is not only is like Montrose grown up with, and we get into a really good discussion in the next episode, but not only is Montrose grown up in a time which is unforgiving to the race that he has, but specifically added on top of that, the, the you know, his, his sexual preference is also something that is deeply, you know, unacceptable for the time. So it's, it's like he's got a twofer when it comes to you know, being ostracized or being the, you know, uh, considered less human, which is the yeah. the horrible the horrible fact. So of course, you know he's having to deal with all that shit, like on his shoulders, and not that I am in any way, shape, or form um, advocating it. But it speaks very much to his actions when it comes to that because the beatings are specifically that. It's the fact that he can't, you know, he has to play, you know, the the husband in a relationship where there is no love. Um, uh, and his, I, I, I'm gonna. Uh, there's not. We romantic get to later love, on. But, we get yeah. to. There's a different sort of love. Different yes. sort of love. Right, but uh, he, not, but not he's filled with rage. Love. He's a furious yeah. dude because because of... he can't be who he is. Exactly. Exactly. He can't. He can't be true to himself, and that festers away. And when he looks at his kid, uh, who may not be his kid, but we'll get to that. When he looks at his his kid, although I'm 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 I may be moving slightly away from that. Um, I st idea. Uh, I, I I'm still, still on. Are, but... I'm still on Team George, but yeah. But I think it's clear that no matter what, he clearly loves Atticus. Yeah, it it does. He it, it does. Uh, and I think he like in his weird warp brain, what he's doing to quote unquote toughen up his son is right in his right in his head, and that's you know he do I don't think he understands the fucking mental scarring that he's caused that, I guess. And I think it's like, you, it's fucking a brilliantly acted scene here. There isn't the, the actor that plays Atticus again. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, because this is a uh, Jonathan... Jonathan Ma Majors. That's right. And, and He I, is incredible in this scene. Like, absolutely jaw-droppingly incredible because you go through the full spectrum of him actually starting to piece together these different parcels of his entire life with a brand new lens, a brand new context. And it's fucking horrific to see. Yeah. And, and there's a, a scene in the next episode where I even made the note, like we need to call him out more often for, because mm. we're always talking about like journey Smollett and, 
you know, uh, uh, Jamie Chung recently, and you know, we, there's a new he's, spotlight actor every yeah, week. But he he's... he is really these two episodes in particular. Seven. And the, there's a whole dialogue very early in episode eight, which I think is kind of fucking incredible with him as well. And I think well, once again, the show's comfortable enough to say, right, he's he is our quote unquote main character, right. But we are happy to spend a huge amount of time with these other characters because they are of such a high acting quality and their stories are equally, if not more interesting than Atticus's story as the through line, that we can do that. And the beauty of the show is it can be so confident to do that. But then when we have to come back to the Atticus story, you don't miss a beat. Like he delivers, the show delivers on these performances and he's phenomenal in this scene. Yeah. Yeah, and like the show does high melodrama at times, mm-hmm. and and the reason that plays so well and sits so easily alongside all the social commentary and stuff is is because every actor is just fucking killing it. Oh, so that's uh, uh, as uh, it is the embarrassment of riches you talk about across the board. There's not one performance I've seen in the show that I don't think is great. Yeah, and all right. Speaking to, of, yep, yeah, yeah. <laughs> swing it on. <laughs> and Hippolyta it, it is hitting the road. Like She's now, that, packing up our Woody, right? And Ruby is gonna babysit D, who, um, you know, Hippolyta is like, hey, let's do the checklist for the trip, and D doesn't want to. She's mm-hmm. upset, and um, then Ruby sees Atticus and Letty uh, coming down the road. As Hippolyta is hitting the road, and mm-hmm. they're like, "Hey, can we borrow Woody to go to St. Louis?" And she's like, "Fuck no!" <laughs> and they're like, "What do you mean no?" And she's like, "I mean no. I've got to take a trip. This isn't your car." Which is the literal of my thoughts throughout this entire show since it started. It's like everyone just gets access to Woody in their fucking car. Yeah, and so. She not only leaves, she runs the the stop sign on her way out of there. Mm -hmm. And Letty uh, stays behind to talk to Ruby while Atticus is going to go arrange for a bus to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a nice moment between Letty and Ruby here where Letty... Um, Letty apologizes and she says, look, you know, all my life I've been trying not to be our mother... And, and that's just what I did. I was trying to play you and I don't, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. And Ruby says, you know, as long as I knew our mother, the one thing she ne- never did was apologize. Apologize. Yeah. So yeah. you're not your mother at that stage. And that's just, it's a nice reconciliation between the characters. Yeah. It's not like they're not rushing into each other's arms, but like the chill is starting to thaw. Yeah. And Plus, at this stage, we know that both of them have knowledge the other one doesn't know, and they're all fucking linked. <laughs> yes, right. And and I like that. Again, we'll get into it the next episode, but I like the fact that this show doesn't dick around with that too much. Yeah, it's I, like it would frustrate me as well if we had to go through another four, you know, another four episodes. Like the the last episode is the reveal. You know, what I mean, fuck that. Right. You know, like, I like the fact that there's, we'll get to it, but there's a scene between Letty and Ruby where it's just like, we're just going to come clean. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really nice. But and anyway, so Hippolyta is now uh, on the road to Kansas, which is where the coordinates are leading, or the quadnets. And, quadnets. Um, got the quadnet. And then she sees this uh, black woman on a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. cruising by and Hippolyte gets so excited and is like waving and you know it's just seeing this woman on her own it's freedom yeah free and 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 having this like you can tell like Hippolyte is the kind of person that's like oh she's on an adventure you mm-hmm. know and and she opens up her lunch and finds that D has in fact packed a comic that she's hidden in there which she didn't give her to hit the road, and mm-hmm. uh, it's called Orinthia Blue is the the name of the the comic, mm-hmm. um, and it's a, a sci fi comic, Duncan, which will become Ooh. very important later. Uh, it has a woman in space, mm-hmm. hmm. kind of a bubbly space helmet, and stuff. yeah, kind of the the, the kind of fifties design of kind of sci fi. Yeah, uh, hmm. that hmm. kind of retro pop art sci fi kind of look. It's very cool, hmm. and. Hmm. <laughs> And so then we go to St. Louis for uh, the television show that I want. 
which is Atticus getting off the bus and meeting Miss Ellsbury, who is a friend of Atticus's cousin, Ethel. Mm -hmm. And Ethel and uh, Mrs. Ellsbury um, just kind of fell in to uh, friendship with one another because of their husbands and stuff. Mm -hmm. And as they got older and their husbands died, they were just like, you know what? We're just going to hang out with each other until this thing runs out. How about that? (laughs) And so they were close friends and, and she recalls stories about a family book, but she says, I'm pretty sure that got burned up in Tulsa. Another mention of the Tulsa riots. Mm -hmm. And she does say though, like, Hey, I've got a picture of your cousin. So wait right here. I'll be right back. And then the show leaves her and Atticus to go to Mayfield, Kansas, where Hippolyta arrives at a remote observatory, which is one of the most fucking rocking things you can write when taking notes on a show, <laughs> is that the, the character has followed the coordinates of this or, or, or all the way to this remote space observatory in the middle of nowhere in kansas it's a sentence that's written specifically for duncan and bo to have fun with yeah i mean it's like full of the coordinates to the orrery in the middle of a remote setting yeah and it's 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 the kind of plot stuff that it's very pulpy and kind of silly but it's so Mm. fun and wonderful and i love a show like this fits the show like a glove yeah it like right. It fits the tone, the pulpy tone of it, and that's what I love. Is there's not a show that has this kind of the, this kind of spirit of like, yeah, we're gonna be kind of audacious and and sometimes borderline exploitative, mm-hmm. but that's just kind of the nature of the show. We're we're the kind of show where we're gonna get gooey with the effects, and there's gonna be a, an abandoned space observatory and shit yeah, like it, that it's so it good. reminds me and it's not it's not in the same level and it is a, a really like kind of out there comparison but when you think of things like the x-files or you think of things like buffy the vampire slayer like it, it, fundamentally at their core the show you know what the show is you know what you're getting into but that doesn't mean that episodes can't experiment with completely different tones and different styles of storytelling but always feel intrinsically at the core that's what the show is and that's what lovecraft country has done from the start it's taking different aspects, it's taking down different roads. We went kind of Goonies action adventure esque at times, but uh, first and foremost, always feels like Lovecraft Country. You always return to that um, as it, as its kind of core. And even in this episode, which is about to go fifties sci fi pulp, pulp's the best word for it because it's very pulpy. Yeah, um, and never loses its through line of this is Lovecraft Country, um, and I think that's I think that's great. Like you, you can sometimes push things. It's such a fine line between pushing things in a fun and playful way into a genre, which, or even your interpret interpretation of a genre, which could be perceived as kind of um, a bit cringy. And Lovecraft Country takes it always right to that edge, but never over it. And I think that's that to me is really clever filmmaking. Uh, and TV show writing is you know exactly what that line is and you know how far you can push against that line. And when she rolls up on that, and like I had in the back of my head, because you mentioned that a couple of episodes ago, um, that you had a theory about time travel. And so I was just like, all right, so they time travel from here. Um, that's literally what I had before she even stepped foot inside the observatory. I was like, right, so this is a time travel machine. Um, and like in the back of my head, it's like, right, Bo said, there's a chance that George is going to come back and all the rest. Like, I, I I had this all kind of set out. Uh, I didn't have it set out in a way which makes sense in the next episode. Uh, and I'm not discrediting some of your theories from earlier on in the season. I don't think it is mole people like I thought it was in every show. Um, always mole people. Um, mole people. Mole people. <laughs> Taste like mole, look like people. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, it is like I I was excited because it, like at this point all bets are off. If she can time travel, she can get this machine working in time travel. All bets are fucking off. 
right. on what we can do. And I couldn't have predicted where we would go with this. Right. It took it, right. It took my expectation of like, oh, we're gonna have an honest to goodness goodness time machine. And it was mm-hmm. like, what if we have a universe machine? And, oh, <laughs> well, fuck me. All right, sorry, Lovecraft Country. Oh, oh bo, oh bo, you're thinking so two dimensional. Let's think three dimensional. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, you dumb motherfucker. Like it's a, it's like when uh, uh, Jean Luc Picard has to deal with like people from the twentieth century on Next genera- Generation. <laughs> he's just like, oh, well, you're all just horribly stupid, aren't you? <laughs> no, we have no need of money here. We, we. <laughs> it turns out that that was a a bunch of bullshit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Cap- out- Capitalism was horrible. Yes. <laughs> Turns out when you take all those things away that make you compete against each other and instead work for the greater good of humanity collectively as a group, which some people may call socialism, uh, good things happen. Yeah. <laughs> but so, <Weird. laughs> so it's that attitude that. Yeah, is what we're getting at. <laughs> but anyway, so we cut back to Chicago for a second where Letty and D and D's friends are playing cards. Mm-hmm. And Ruby and Letty have uh, another little talk in the kitchen where Ruby, like Letty is like, hey, where have you been staying? And Ruby's like, oh, you know, whatever. Hey, uh, what about Atticus <laughs> and you? And uh, oh, you, you know, whatever, let's change the subject right now. Yeah. <laughs> And Letty's like, oh, you know, he's a lot of help around the house. And and uh, there's a really good Ruby like, mm-hmm, I bet you can use that kind of help around the house. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there's a moment where Letty is like really hungry where she's like, oh, I've been hot all day and want to eat deviled eggs or some shit. And um, Ruby <laughs> is like, yeah, the only time, you know, mama ever felt like that was when she was pregnant. And, <laughs> and Letty's like, hey. <laughs> I've got a <to> poop. Yeah. <laughs> and so we we cut back to uh Atticus in St. Louis where it, when they're going through all these family albums um he sees a dude that has the same birthmark that he does. Mm. And he uh and oh Letty calls to say that she found the orrery and the coordinates, the coordinates. Coordinates. And and while Letty is kind of filling Atticus in on this, Ruby is kind of eavesdropping. And there's a spy in the house (laughs) of love tonight. (laughs) And meanwhile... Back in the rest of the episode, um, Hippolyta, look, sometimes you get a single little prince on this show. Um, Hippolyta finds a, this weird machine inside the observatory, which has mm-hmm. a, a keyhole uh, just begging for this fancy key of hers. And so she inserts the key and turns it, and this back to the future LED <laughs> clock starts flipping around. <laughs> and. And Hippolyta is like making notes about planetary rotation and shit and working out other coordinates. Coordinates. And then then she enters some stuff and hits this dial on the machine. And as she's working, you can hear some people entering the building. Yeah. They were like, hey, somebody's down there. And they're clearly uh, sent by Lancaster. You know, they're uh, some of his goons from the police force mm-hmm. and they're like, Hey, what are you doing down here? And what's going on with this machine? And, and shit. And is like, uh, I don't know. This is real fucked up. Uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Atticus. <laughs> yeah. Cause let, let he told on the phone that she found that, that the orrery was, or uh, was, <laughs> was with Hippolyta. And that's probably where she's went off. Um, and like so Atticus like somehow manages to I don't know how close those places are that they went to. So Well, St. Louis is Missouri. Kansas is right next door. Yeah. So and, close. Eh, so feasible. Maybe. Eh, feasible. Ah, let's let's not let's not let's not look at this. Right. Uh but yeah, just as the police are about to do what police do to black people in this time and 
weirdly enough, still to this day, um, they're about to they're about to shake her down and potentially shoot her. And Atticus comes in to save the day, Bo, right. but in Atticus's way, which usually means messy and causes more trouble than saving. Right, like he, he he's wrestling a dude for the gun, and the gun goes off, and it hits the machine, which really starts spinning up at this point. Yeah, it just starts flipping through. Very similar to if you've got a, a kind of projector, and you have slides of your holiday that you've been on, and you're just flipping through them. <laughs> yeah. Very much like that. Like, one minute we're here, then we're here, then we're here, and it keeps flipping through them in quick succession. Yeah. And uh, one of these police officers gets uh, gets the boot. Yeah, tossed uh, into and, it of just like, hey, yeah. enjoy maybe Antarctica. And well, that's then, what it looked like. And I was like, oh, he's dead. Yeah. Like, he's like, he's Jack Nicholson at the end of The Shining. And he's like, ah, he's so fucking frozen. Right. Um, and then Hippolyta straight, straight up shoots the other cop. Which seems like an overreaction. But uh, I'll let her off that. <laughs> and then uh, before Atticus can prevent it from happening, Hippolyta gets sucked into this rift in the middle of n- nothing. Yeah. And but he, he goes as he goes in after as well. Right. Because he think he but we don't we don't get anything to do with that until the very end of this episode and then they don't make us wait for an explanation in the next episode and it's so fucking worth it but we're now going to follow us oh, oh, it blew my fucking tits off ball honestly i was sitting i was titless in in episode number eight when they linked all this back and i was like yes the prophecy has been fulfilled right um, it's not just bullshit they didn't lost this um yeah so <laughs> then <laughs> they didn't did lost this <laughs> They flash the coordinate up on the screen, mm-hmm. and it's Hippolyta standing on. This is gonna be my powers of description at their worst. Standing <laughs> on an alien landscape, and there's this big monolithic structure in the distance, mm-hmm. and then some robots appear, and then she wakes up naked in a white room. Yep. Except there are these purple things that like uh, kind of like the goo from Ghostbusters 2, but purple mm-hmm. inserted in her wrists. And then she finally gets a jumpsuit and is able to put that on. And she is greeted by this alien woman <laughs> who An Amazonian like sized alien woman. And that right. she's about fucking nine foot tall. And that's before we talk about how tall an afro is. Right. It's kind of the Fletch joke of he's 6'2 with the afro 6'8. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's that, but it's wide too. And yeah. it borrows heavily. A lot of this stuff does borrows heavily from the Afro futurist movement mm-hmm. that is popularized by people like Sun Ra. Beyonce has done a lot of stuff with this. Rihanna's done a lot of stuff with this. And it's sort of this aesthetic art form uh that sort of celebrates the integration of technology with much more like organic and primitive uh and by primitive i just mean uh, you know sort of like uh round organic uh structures and shapes and stuff like that it's real it's beautiful like if you want to have a good time like i i sent you a couple of pictures um Mm -hmm. but just google afro afro futurist and just scroll through some of that artwork. It's really striking and beautiful. And um, and so a lot of this art style is borrowed from that. Um, but at any rate, this uh, alien uh, is like, Hippolyta is like, hey, let me out of here. And the, the alien is like, you are not in a prison. Mm-hmm. And then the door closes and Hippolyta is like, God damn it, I am. You're a liar. And but she starts like puzzling out how to get this door open. But as soon as she does, the alien woman is on the other side of it and then just blasts her back into the room. <laughs> and she says, uh, the alien says, Name yourself. And Hippolyta is like, What are you talking about? And she says, Name where you want to be. Mm-hmm. And she says, Where do I want to be? I'd love to be in Paris dancing on stage with Josephine Baker. And then she is, Duncan. Because <laughs> she was like, strap yourselves in. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be going everywhere all at once. And she is being ushered out of the, the backstage onto the stage where she is 
d- dancing as part of a troop behind Josephine Badly. Baker because she doesn't know the move. She's just there. She and, she's a great dancer, but she doesn't know the moves. Yeah. And she's naturally awful, but she tries. Mm-hmm. And then backstage, uh, Josephine Baker is like, hey, I saw you out there and you really sucked. But I, we've all had those nights. Let me show you some moves. And, and so it's Josephine Baker teaching Hippolyta the moves. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, okay, good job. And then she starts to take off and Hippolyta is following her. <laughs> and then she just closes <laughs> the dressing room door. Like, hey, right, no face. <laughs> right. Like, hey, look, I'm a star. You know, like I'm not, we had a nice yeah. little moment, but we're not buddies. <laughs> and <laughs> it's a nice move. I really like it. And then we we have some different coordinates, which appear to be uh, coordinates that are both sort of place and time. Mm -hmm. And Hippolyta is partying with Josephine Baker and dancing, and it's Lady Marmalade playing while you get a montage of her living this kind of libertine lifestyle in, in Paris, being a dancer with Josephine Baker. And at one point, Josephine Baker and Frida Kahlo, the, the painter, are making out on a couch. And then they're toasting. And there's a conversation where uh, Josephine Baker and Hippolyta are talking about like the transient nature of life. Mm-hmm. And Hippolyta has this great moment where she says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm celebrating my freedom, but I, at the same time, I see everything that I've been robbed of. Yeah. And I'm so angry at white people and me. And, and Josephine Baker says, well, what are you going to do with all that anger? Who are you going to be? And, (laughs) and she screams, I am Hippolyta. And then we're in another time and place (laughs) where she seems to be being trained in a tribe of like warrior black women. She's going through the process that Arnold Schwarzenegger goes through in Conan the (laughs) Bunny. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. She's been amazing. (laughs) And it's like this matriarchal society where she fights her trainer over and over again until she becomes a great warrior and can Mm -hmm. finally beat her trainer and then give her spear to the queen of this tribe. And then rock music starts playing and they go to war. Fucking amazing. (laughs) It's like, oh, it's it's like this. This TV show, man. Honestly. The, it's, it, the song is called Fire by Mother's Finest. Look mm. it up. And as this song is playing, they go to war with a bunch of Confederate soldiers. Yep. And, like, it's this giant battle and legs are getting cut off and people are getting shot and the, and the warriors are making their final stand. And then she says, I am Hippolyta. George's wife. Yep. And then we're back in bed with George. Well, hello, God damn it. Look at it. <laughs> He's back. And it, back and back. It's, it's kind of the repeat of the first time we met him. They're in bed yeah. together. And she explains the multiverse to George. She's like, you're not going to believe this shit. Well, if there's anyone that's going to understand and appreciate it and take it straight away on face value, it's George. Yeah. He does. And Getting misses the point slightly, but he, he at least hears what she's saying. Doesn't dismiss it. And you're right. And and you know, it, and she loves him. And 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 like this is the friend she could celebrate this stuff with, and all that. And um, then he he's marveling at everything, and he says, you know, the 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 amazing thing to me is after all of this you decided that what you wanted to be was my wife. Yeah, it was a bad move. <laughs> and, all right, so here is the quote. This is the exactly the lines. And it's just a beautiful piece of writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, she says, when I was a kid, I thought I was big enough to to have every right to name something out of this world. And then I started shrinking myself. And by the time I met you... I'd already gotten so small and I thought you knew how big I wanted to be. I thought you saw me, but you just stood by and let me shrink myself more for you. And, Oh, it's just this like beautiful, painful admission that yeah, like, because we know that when she was a kid, she did name 
yeah you know a, a constellation and that was taken away from her because of her race and at that point the, the the crowning achievement of her youth was taken away and of course at that point she did and then she had a kid and she wasn't allowed to go out and journey with her husband she had to stay and keep the you know the the the, the, the shop running and uh, yeah and and she, she like it's only through these experiences this adventure that she's been on that she realizes exactly how small she's become uh, and the fact that George couldn't understand that, or the George the George looks through a lens of well, she loves me, she's happy with me, and that's all that really matters. And th- yeah, it's a huge component of what matters in a relationship. Yeah. But what also matters in a relationship is the ability to support someone fully to their aspirations uh, and not take it into the account of how it impacts your aspirations or your life. You have to support unconditionally um and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful scene she, once again incredible fucking acting like just uh, out the park it does fucking she'll just drop some like yeah right here's your scene like just do the best scene ever oh you have oh well that's great <laughs> like oh lords yeah it's and and awesome. w- again worth pointing out the actress's name is Anjanu ellis who and is she's playing brilliant just tremendous in this episode it is Mm -hmm. you know it's one of those things where people like will say well oh that performance was brave and but this one genuinely is like she is legitimately she is physically naked and in in uh scenes in this episode oh yeah you see Um, everything yeah, but at the same time, she is also like goes through this emotional journey, and and she from, plays a sexy dancer. Yeah, she plays a fucking Amazonian warrior. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, like, she, and and every role that she does here, I believe, it. I believe and, she's a, a go-go dancer. I believe she's a warrior. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, I believe she's vulnerable. I, like, it's fucking great. And then at the end of this, she she says, "I am Hippolyta Discoverer." Mm-hmm. And then she takes his hand, and then she's in this that pop culture. She's in the, the rocket ship from Arinthia Blue, mm-hmm. and it, it's her and George on a new planet, exploring, cataloging animals and plants. Uh, I mean, it's like the heaven for explorers, you know? Yeah, and it reminded me the aliens that that walk by them, the wee green things, are like miniature versions of the alien that's in. Uh, Joe Dante's The Explorers. Yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. It's fucking, like, and anything that references anything to do with that makes my uh, heart sing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, they are, they're just, they're living the life, and it's all that kind of, uh, how do you describe that colour? Like, powder blues and powder pinks. And, that kind of pastel you know, palette. Yeah, and... yeah, everything's coloured in those colours. It's vibrant and rich, and, like, I would I... have any of the shots in this one like still framed and like put on my wall that they're that fucking vibrant and beautiful and uh, artistic it's fucking great yeah i mean you just want to live in this world like you're only there for a moment and you mm-hmm. could just live there for an episode or more you know it's so beautiful and then uh w- then hippolyte is suddenly talking to this space alien again from where she initially started this journey and and she says now that i've been so much i can't imagine ever being so small again Mm -hmm. and the alien says like you're ready like you're ready to transcend to this next phase of evolution like you've you've proven yourself that you're you can be anything like you understand now that all you have to do is think it and you Mm -hmm. can be that so what what do you want to be name yourself and then at, at like you know, she talks about the expansiveness of, of, of her life and, and need for freedom. And then she thinks of Diana and, and, and we leave her there. Yeah. And we cut back, back to earth where Atticus appears from out of this reality rift and has a book in his hand. Yeah. We're going to get to that. (laughs) And he tries to get the machine working again to get Hippolyta back, but police are coming, there are sirens wailing, and he has to run. So as he flees the scene, the last thing we see is that the comic that Diana gave to Hippolyta is tucked under the dead body of the cop. Which is probably going to come up at some point. A hundred percent, and let's <laughs> let's not let's not dither or dally. Mm-hmm. 
All right, so episode eight is called Jigabobo. Yep. <laughs> um, and it begins with the strains of Bananarama's Cruel Summer. Yeah, this this episode is called Jigabobo and has scenes in it that are terrifying. <laughs> right, th- yeah, there should be a warning label on this one of like, hey, this will scare the fuck out of you. <laughs> it's probably what I would mention. Misha Green comes back to direct on this episode and boy, does she ever. <laughs> Holy right. fucking shit. <laughs> Right, like, hey, uh, did you think that y- you'd seen everything that could give you a nightmare? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, just you wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, but Crow Summer, you play that song, you have a happy fucking Duncan oh, every day of the week. It's pretty good. It's pretty <clears throat> good. You and I have a, a special affinity for both uh, Banana Rama and, and uh, Shakespeare's sister, I believe. We do, yeah, yeah. I, I like it's. I, I don't know quite what it is. Uh, like I watched that. Um, oh, that, that Johnny Knoxville horror movie. That one recently. What was it called? Yeah, uh, we summon the darkness. Yes, we summon the darkness, and it it fucking <laughs> it. I like I was on. Oh, it's an alright movie, but it closes with the pow, and oh, I was like, nice. oh, that'll do my heart good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I found myself. That's named oh, after a Star Trek character. Yeah, I, I spent like the next like, like as soon as it finished, I was like, like fucking China in your hands about my house, like just like, like at night when the family's asleep, there's me slow dancing and mouthing the mouth and the worst that pow song. I have my quirks, bow, and it turns out that maybe you have similar ones as well. Once again, another reason for our enduring friendship slash hatred. Let me, let me, yeah, a rivalry. (laughs) Let me tell you a a quick story. So we have our our movie nights Mm -hmm. uh, on Thursdays. And so a couple of friends and their daughter came over uh, Thursday night. And when we have a little dinner and then we watch a movie, we were having some lasagna, uh, Mm. which was quite good. Um, It turned cold recently (laughs) and it hit the spot. Uh, it's even better when it's cold. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cold weather and lasagna, man. That's where it's at for me. You give me mm-hmm. uh, anyway. Uh, another... You are the Garfield of podcasters. The last thing. <laughs> I, I mean, it's one of those things. I've struggled with that title, but I think it's true. <laughs> but so anyway, as we're eating dinner, I've got so like a Spotify playlist playing in the background, mm-hmm. and. On the on the playlist rolls up Whitey's on the Moon by Gil Scott Heron. <laughs> of course it does. And it was one of those moments of like, huh, do I let it go? <laughs> and finally, uh one one of my friends that was there, Kim, she says, What is this? <laughs> And so, the, you know, then I get into the story of uh, Whitey's on the Moon, which then leads to Lovecraft Country. But mm-hmm. it was one of those moments of like, yeah, I guess my musical taste is pretty weird. Oh, yeah. Mine, like, mine's is, like, definitively weird. And, uh, like, I, I did, um, I'd, like, I recently this year started back up uh, a kind of a music podcast, mostly based around kind of, like, metal and alternative music, because that's... That, that's primarily what I listen to. Yeah, yeah. But what's what's really interesting about doing that show is how often I will reference like like music from the eighties specifically, and it's because of the household I got my, my single parent. My mom listened to fucking everything, so I, I grew up listening from everything to like Motown to Bowie to Elvis to I, specifically new romantics like all the new romantics 80s yeah. bands um so i like that's just my so I, like, i've got a, a, a silly knowledge for that sort of stuff um and yeah you like if you're stuck in a car with me for an extended journey you could easily go from the blast beats of a cannibal corpse song straight into the reflex by Duran Duran. flex flex <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like the re blip 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 ba dum ba dum you try to hide this time man <laughs> just I, I'm, getting nowhere all right so like, like what quick a uh, quick aside uh best duran duran song mm. a view to a kill oh it's a good one the reflex mm. union of the snake <laughs> Uh, I, I feel like we need a fourth. 
Hey. G- give me one. I feel I don't want to monopolize uh, this. Give me, give me one of the big ones. Hey, like Girls on Film. I mean, hey. is that one of the best though, Duncan? Really? I really like Girls on Film. All right, we'll put it on Her the list. Her name is Rio. And girls she on. Dances see, on I think Girls on Film and Rio are of a, a strike. Like I lean into the like the weirder Duran Duran gets, like Wild Boys and shit like oh, that. Wild Boys is fucking great. Yeah. Wild Boys. <laughs> Like Jesus, Simon, calm down. <laughs> Never close this. Oh, Jesus! You understand? He he was like coked out his face in knee deep in pussy. Of course, he was doing his riffs on like the Road Warrior and <laughs> like what in the fuck is Seven and the Ragged Tiger even about? <laughs> but I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a. I mean, A Beauty I Kill to me works so well because of the Bond movie that sure. has Christopher Walken. So I will always. James <laughs> Bond! <laughs> more. More power. But all right, here's the best scene. And I, this is a joke I'm stealing for myself. The best scene of View to a Kill is mm-hmm. when. Um, when when James Bond is posing as Mr. Sinjin Smythe, the horse <laughs> purchaser, and he's he's in the office with <laughs> just just take a second to go through that again. He's posing as Sinjin Smythe, the, yeah, the it's horse purchase. Yeah, he's buying a horse, and <laughs> and James Bond is you know pretending and like, oh, oh, please tell me all about your horses. And <laughs> and while he's talking, Christopher Walken is on uh like an Apple two E uh computer, <laughs> like pulling up like he's he snapped a sneaky picture of him and is getting the oh, yeah. read out, and because it's like a computer from nineteen eighty, blah 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 blah, um. Yeah. <laughs> It, it takes forever for the picture to load. And then yeah. once it finally does, it gives him like the name. Oh, his name is James Bond. And like Christopher Walken reacts to this information. He goes, oof. Yeah, it's and, still, like Walken is fucking amazing. <laughs> and, the scene. and then like the next line will pop up and it'll be like license to kill. And he goes, wow. <laughs> and then it's like kill on side. He's wowie wow. Seeing him get progressively more excited, the more dangerous that yeah, James because, Bond seems to be. Uh, he's, he's one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite villains. He's ever. so good. And to be honest, he's like in terms of Bond villains, his overall goal and plan isn't that nefarious compared to some of the other ones. It's fairly small, but yeah, yeah. compared to like the rest of them. But for whatever reason, the fact he's like you know, it's revealed that he's like this failed. Like experimentation and <laughs> right. eugenics, and you know, like, and it totally he plays into that, and then you 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 put him beside fucking Grace Jones, and I'm like, this is like, and then you you Duran Duran, the fucking soundtrack, and then you have a scene with people leaping off the Eiffel Tower. I'm telling you, like, dying death by butterfly, um, <laughs> big butterfly. yeah, like it's California it, it's, girls as James oh, Bond ski, yes. and like that that is. A, an affront to God and man, and I can't look away. Yeah, it's, it's like that's the, like for for all the negatives, like the like the, the James Bond movies have, and there are a lot in there specifically about how you know the subject matter does not age well, mm-hmm. um, or the actions of the characters. Like when you talk about a Bond movie, you're on a fucking ride because you're going to talk about a lot of shit and you're going to go all over the place and like have conversations that you probably shouldn't really think. Like Bond has done everything, and as a result, you'll get to do everything. And there's nothing better than seeing Roger Moore like against a green screen pretend to fucking snowball. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's the- <laughs> can you believe I invented snowboarding? Hmm. <laughs> Um, but by the way, we're, we're we're rocking out with songs. I think the one we missed, and I had to do a bit of checking to make sure that I got the name right. But uh, we're talking about classic all time, even though it's a ballad and it's much more somber. It's fucking huge. Uh, Ordinary world. 
Oh sure, yeah. Huge. I'm I'm a hundred percent on board with that. I, I'm 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 gonna see uh, or not- n- n- notorious. Notorious um, is great as well. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like you get no like Giant Giant's like fucking amazing. Um, I had to pick a favorite, you bastard. Uh, I do love the reflex because the reflex has one of my favorite bass lines. It's good, yeah. You know, it's fucking it's funky as fuck. It and this is. is a pop, a pop band who like mixed a lot of funk in there. I'm maybe gonna go. Ah, fuck it, I'm going to a kill because I do, I do love that. I, I mean, that is that band doing the. Bond thing, but doing it as Duran Duran, where other artists do their version of a Bond song. Like Duran Duran just do a Duran Duran song, but rock it up a bit more, and then all of a sudden it is a Bond song. And that's the difference. So there we go. Uh, uh, Until quick... we dance into, into the fire. fire. Fucking bitching. Yeah. I- I'm going to listen to this as, as you finish recording. <laughs> Where's the view to the kill? <laughs> oh, man. More Night power. time covers me <laughs> anyway um this is not the duran duran podcast this is the love country hey, lovecraft country i du- can't even speak duran what is country. in this drink um all right so here we're gonna get to <laughs> the second country. sentence of my notes about this uh episode um mm. so diana is in this crowd of people uh shuffling th- through the streets of chicago on the south side on a very hot day the as, hottest day ever. Even I was hot looking at this. Yeah, as Cruel Summer is playing. And uh, Diana is not doing okay. No. Uh, she is. She's having an, a real emotional day here. Uh, as we see, like, as people are gathering and, and, and shuffling and walking, we see some dudes speaking out. And we realize that a young black kid has been killed. Yeah, because up until that point, I thought, well, the, the Betty Tepalaya quick. Right, like what you have, no, that's the presumption is maybe yeah. this is Hippolytus' funeral, but mm-hmm. um, it turns out it, it's a friend of Diana's, of Dee's, mm-hmm. a kid named Emmett Till, who they affectionately called Bobo. Mm-hmm. And not me, no relation. <laughs> and so Ruby, who is still ca- taking care of Diana, um, is like, hey, we we need to keep moving, kind of keeping Diana under her wing. And Diana goes, what is that smell? Mm. And Ruby says, well, you know, this has to be one of the hottest days of the year. And and kind of lets it trail off. And then D says, oh, it's him. Mm-hmm. Meaning the kid whose yeah. coffin is on display and is now rotting under the summer sun. At which point my notes are Lovecraft Country, don't ever change. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yes. This is this is the most horrible shit I've ever seen. And also, only only be, only bested by the description of what happened to the kid later on. Right. We'll get to that. And oh man, this episode's so fucking good. I I really did a turnaround on this one hard. Uh so yeah. Letty and Atticus are in this crowd too, and Atticus is hustling Letty a little bit like, hey, you want to sit down and rest? You want some water? Do you need to sit down? Have you thought about resting? And she's mm-hmm. like, what the fuck is this? And Mantra shows up. Because he doesn't know yet. Well, he That's knows. True. Yeah, he knows, but we don't think, she doesn't think that he knows. She doesn't know And that we he don't knows. know either. We don't know that he knows that she doesn't know that he knows that. Well, we no, know I mean. now that he knows, but we didn't know when we were watching the show for the first time, we didn't know then what we know yeah. now that he knows. I know. All right. So, <laughs> Montrose shows up and is like, hey, who wants some water? <laughs> and Atticus is just like, I don't hear nothing. You want some water, Letty? <laughs> Which, by saying that, means you did hear it or you would be able to offer it. <laughs> hey, I know you can hear me, mister. I'm not a ghost. <laughs> and... <laughs> know why he has to assert that but then we cut back to diana again still not doing okay at all Mm -hmm. and while ruby is like man maybe we shouldn't have brought her and montrose is like this is a and i'm quoting the show but it's a horrible thing to say and hear he says Mm -hmm. uh it is every negro's rite of passage and diana sees a picture of her friend bobo you know emmett till yeah, and while she is staring at this and just feeling the weight of her friend has died, her her father has just died, her mother is missing and presumed dead. 
Yeah, like her world has just been devastated. Yeah. And what Letty is like, hey, when do you think uh, Hippolyta might come back? And why do you think Hippolyta might come back? <laughs> and it's very clear he said nothing about this book that he brought back. So he can't tell her, like, I came back so Hippolyta could too. Yeah, because he was cl- he, he he was clutching that book at the end of the last episode. He came through the tunnel with a book. The book was called Lovecraft Country. Yes. And it was written by George Freeman, who, if you're me, you're like that. Uncle George wrote a book called Well, Love I've been Country? working on for a bit. I, I want to work, do a novel for a long time, goddammit. And finally told myself I'm going to take some time and write the great American book. But then I was like, well, Bo said that they were going to use time travel to bring back George, so maybe they bring back George and he writes a book called Lovecraft Country, so that makes total sense. So that's why he's confident that she's she's going to come back, right. or being a Lufwee's answer, because she must come back and she must bring Uncle George back with her, because that's why that book exists. And Lovecraft Country is like, <laughs> oh, foolish little Duncan, <laughs> you keep thinking two-dimensionally, we're thinking omnidirectionally <laughs> and I was like oh right uh, as we found out later on but uh, yeah he's been say- he's, not only has he been a bit suspect about it he keeps looking at his watch a lot Bo yeah yeah he's this got somewhere funeral. to be and he doesn't want to be here also suddenly everybody's like hey where's D and they're like oh god damn it she has slipped away and Montrose, Montrose has a great yeah it's a great line here about of all days this is not the day that she she should be out there herself yeah we've got to find her mister and <laughs> So everyone kind of goes their separate ways to find D. Like Letty's going to her place. Montrose is going back to uh, D's house. Um, and Atticus is like, uh, I'll check the five and dime, I guess. Yeah. And they're like, uh, all right, weirdo. And mm-hmm. so we we cut to D, who is wandering outside this uh, arcade and ice cream shop. And they're like colored lights flashing on her from within while she's on the street. And as she passes by, a couple of girls come out giggling and eating ice cream. And D uh, hearing their laughter throws. Yeah. She throws rocks at them and starts screaming at them. There's nothing to laugh about. And then she starts cry laughing and you're like, oh shit, she's a good actress too. Yeah, oh yeah, she's fucking amazing. And <laughs> like, there's literally not a mad like every every actor for every performance, large or small, in Lovecraft Country is a fucking great actor. They yeah. get the best out of all of them. Yeah, Jada Harris is her name. She's like you said, she's incredible in this. Mm-hmm. And and so anyway, she kind of wanders into this alley where a couple of cops pull up. And it's Lancaster, the 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 cop that we know knows some magic and, and is sort of the heir apparent to the uh, Braithwaite uh, clan, to that mm-hmm. cult, that coven. And um, it's him and one of his flunkies. And Lancaster has her comic, the bloody comic that they found on the dead cop. And they're like, hey, what's your mother's name? And she, you know, de-terrified is like her name's Hippolyta. And then the flunky cop says something very rude yes, about, about African names and yeah, African tribal names. Right. Uh, to be specific. Where I know, you know, that we all know that that's not the, you know, the derivation. Uh, derivation, is that the right word? Uh, I think not. etymology. Etymology um, of, of, of Hippolyta, where yeah. that actually comes from. Um, and, and he self respected. Fucking quasi intelligent person, <laughs> right? It, yeah, you you know where it comes from, but this guy's a fucking muppet. Uh, so. Yeah, and indeed, to her credit, as when he says that, she's both offended by it, but also like you dumb shit. Yeah, and like, she's locking that into. I'm going to use this later on in a lane, which is fucking incredible. Right, I'm going to have my own Letty moment later in the es- episode. Don't even worry about it, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's like stopping everything, looking at the audience and addressing them. Yeah. yeah. I bet you're wondering how I ended up here. Let me tell you. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, you're going to see a lot of awful shit, but there's going to come a time when I'm going to lay it down and it, every, mm-hmm. everything's going to be great. So 
Uh, yeah, because they do like brutalize her. Like she tries to run away, they trip her up, they pull her back. Yeah, um, and, and draw runes on either side of her. Yep, and, and then main cop did uh, spits a, a nice throaty Bailey spit into his hand, and then places like the the spit on her forehead, uh, smears it more than places it, and then starts a, an incantation of some sort. And then we get like <laughs> like all the flies from the Amityville appear, and then we hear, get out! Um, like it's like, like yeah. that weird... Yeah, it really is. It's like it's, it's the Amityville scene, all the weird fucking like horrible insects start to appear, and the next thing we know, she comes to with spit in her forehead and not entirely sure what has happened, but Bo, I'm sitting in the background going, something weird is about to happen. And as she's walking away, a billboard for, you know, um, the ice cream manufacturer, whoever's the face it's, of the No, cream, cream of weed. It's uh, oatmeal. Oatmeal, right. So yeah. that, thank you for explaining that. Um, like the, the eyes in this picture follow her along and I'm like that. Oh, well, they're spying on her. Because once again... Duncan is thinking two dimensionally and not omnidirectionally like Lovecraft Country. So I was like, "All right, they're just following her to see what she knows, so they can like through any picture or that they'll be able to see her." And I couldn't have been more wrong, both I tried. <laughs> yeah, that's probably accurate. Um, yeah, I was on the, completely the wrong track, going to the wrong destination, like all the way there, just going, "Yeah, we're all going to go to the what wrong train? <laughs> like, <laughs> how did I get off this?" <laughs> One of the things that this episode is clearly doing is it's it's examining the popular representation of black people. Yes. And in this case, it's the cream of wheat, which is a 100% true thing, Duncan. That is the no. actual mascot for that brand at that time. Uh, you might... Well, and also the, the playful name... Yes, and of the title of the episode is <clears throat> right. It it is a, a uncomfortable right. It is very clearly a reference to that kind of uh, black slur and and also very much that type of caricature that yeah. that sort of uh, Uncle Tom. I mean, that's what much of this episode is, is about. But that kind of uh, I I think the term is pick a ninny. It, it was, oh, right. was yeah. one of the descriptions I have I have heard of that. Um, we used to have there was a brand of jam. Now it's like our our world over here maybe doesn't have as many examples of this as America does. Um, but uh, you know, like after the the recent kind of changes in cultural attitudes, specifically aimed at different brands of certain things. We would have things like, I, I imagine you had like Uncle Ben's as a brand. Oh, of course. And Aunt Jemima and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't have Aunt Jemima because that didn't mean anything over here. Um, but we did have, there was a brand of jam mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, over here called Robinson's, um, which is like the most English of English names. <laughs> like, it really, sure. really is. Uh, but the brand logo was, and there is no other way to really use this word. So once again, I apologize in advance if it causes any offense. I feel proud of saying it. But uh, I had a picture of what is known as a gollywog. Uh, and I don't know if that translates well to America. Probably not. not. Entirely. Yep. Um, so it was essentially like a minstrel. So black. Oh, the, black that's piece. the pick and anything. Yes. It ah, is, right. So it is... over here in the UK, that would be classed as a either a minstrel or a, a, a gollywog, and it's it, like horrible terms. But that was the branding for that jam for no fucking reason at all. Yeah. Well, it makes no reference to anything from Africa or anything that would denote anything to do with race. It's fucking jam. Well, it you know was what I mean? It wasn't exotic jam either. It was like <laughs> English fucking rhubarb jam by Robinson's, and that was the logo for fucking years. But that kind of shit was just in the in the popular culture. It wasn't mm. like uh, you could get little ceramic yard ornaments that were kind uh. of those caricatures mm -hmm. and that kind of shit. Like that was just the popular conception of 
of a of black people in many ways you know like yeah. like it was cartoonish and most people recognized it was cartoonish but it was also instantly recognizable as oh well you're talking about black people yeah you know instantly recognizable and at the same time absolutely fucking repugnant you're, and the uh, fact yes. that no one even at the time was like that <laughs> should we be doing this yeah, yeah it, it's, and it's, oh. and and so right and and so this idea of of sort of what people expect black people to be and look like and act like is very much what this episode is about. And part of mm-hmm. that is this artistic representation. And, and so anyway, we put a pin in that for a second because <laughs> we have, like yeah. we are coming back to this and it's going to pay off so, so good. Um, so Letty then arrives back at her place looking for D, but who does she find Duncan? Uh, but our old friend Gia from uh, an episode a couple back, Yep, who has arrived because, like, well, and once again, she's. I feel so sorry for her in this episode because she's arrived specifically because Attic has phoned her to say, How did you know? And she's like, You know what? I'm just going to put a pin in my life just now. I'm not going to quite hit my 100. You know what I mean? I'm going to stop at 99. I've got 99 problems, and an Atticus is one. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to jump on a fucking plane and I'll fly across here all the way to America, a country I've never been in before. Um, kind of post a massive fucking crisis. I imagine the Korean incident is still going on ish mm-hmm. around this time. I'm just going to fly over there into a place that done, you know, I'm, I'm going to arrive and I'm going to like, I'm going to, I'm going to answer face to face like a fucking adult. And um, what she doesn't know <laughs> is that Atticus maybe has moved on and maybe is interested in Letty. And yeah. She might not get the warmest of welcomes, is what I'm trying to put across. Uh, but I genuinely felt sorry for her character. Yeah, I, I really do too. But like <laughs> Le- when she when Letty comes in and sees her, she says, You looking for a room? Mm-hmm. And she says, No, I'm looking for Atticus. There's and- also a description of later on of how our power is triggered. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which it's... made me giggle like a like a fucking fool. I'm such a child at times. I'm like, she's the climax. So <laughs> 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 well, Bo's back on this episode. <laughs> so Bo the hitchhiker killer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so we cut from you know Gia invoking Atticus's name to Atticus who is showing up at the Braithwaite tomb where he's meeting Extina yep and he's like hey how do I cast a spell <laughs> like right straight off the bat yeah hey Extina Extina that's the piece how do I cast a spell and <laughs> she's like hey you never want to know any of this shit before something's up yeah <laughs> and He's like, look, I just want to protect myself and Letty. And uh, and she says, yeah, you want to protect yourself, huh? I know about Hiram's pages. And I hear he lost an arm looking for those. Wink, and, wink. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then he's like, look, I just give you the Ori. The Ori. Mm, Ori. But he says, I think what you really want is this. And he hands mm. her the key. And her eyes light up. Yeah, she's that's like, oh, that's what I want. Play. She's like, play it cool. Play it cool, Christina. Don't raise your... No, my eyes are gone up. And and uh, she says, look, spells aren't just words, stupid. You need <laughs> intention, energy, and a body. And, <laughs> and I like how she describes this. That's how you upset the balance of nature without a disaster. And uh, And then she calls it, Perfect alignment, like perfect well, like, nipple placement. Yeah, it's perfect, perfect alignment. And I love how she is about a disaster because that's how the show started. Yeah, was people invoking that but not doing all those things together, and it, it involved like basically the destruction of all of them and a large mansion building collapsing in on itself. Yeah, and so uh, she basically draws a protection symbol on a wall, and she. She's like, be sure you draw this in chalk or blood or something. And, not in dust. <laughs> yeah, not in dust, stupid. And then you stand in that and you do the spell. And he uh, hands over the key. And then as she leaves, she says, good luck, cousin. It's nice. Mm-hmm. It's a, a nice little throwaway. And mm-hmm. But before she gets totally out the door, he goes, the autumnal equinox. What's going to happen? Yep. 
<laughs> and Exina just stops in the doorway and she goes, you want to know what's going to happen? Somebody's going to be immortal. Yeah, well, this is the thing I love about her as a character is there's no bullshit with Exina. You ask her a question, you get, that, you get the answer. You may not like the answer. You might not understand the answer, but it's honest. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't bullshit anything like, because later on we find out exactly what that is. Um, and... <laughs> by Jove, <laughs> spot on to what she said. You know, here's the thing. We're going to get into this more here in a minute, but Extina is a fascinating character because she's mm. she's kind of the villain, but she's also not horrible. She's, she's the... She's the she's, she, she's willing to grow. Yes, she's... I think the thing is, she, she has a mission, right? She has an end goal. That end goal is immortality. And she will do anything to become a mortal that fits within that. But that does not mean that she will not involve herself in ways that she feels she can turn the situation for other characters in this show. And that's what I quite like about her. It's like she, and the motivation's there, and it's really well written that, you know, as a woman, so she's not allowed to join the Order, she's not allowed to invoke magic or anything like that. And she's been held back from that. So as a result, she's got that chip on her shoulder that when she sees that with other people, she kind of gives them the nudge, the nudge that she never got in that direction. She kind of gives a help man. She doesn't fully help them because she doesn't have to fully help them, but she inserts herself in a way where she's like, "Ah, you know, this is a shortcut. Uh, Just, you know, just to see what will happen and kind of just to do the right thing. And I think that's what makes her a wholly interesting character as we'll get to with the Ruby conversation coming up. Um... Her answer is cold as fuck, but it's accurate. Like what she says in there is like because if it wasn't, Ruby would fight more. Um and, and that's what makes her a really interesting character. It must be a ton of fun to play that character because you're like like what I would class as a cunt here away, excuse the language, um, from being a mustachio you know, twiddling villain. And someone who in any given scene you actually kind of feel yourself totally with and behind um like she's she yeah she got she put ruby through the mix to plant that fucking carved stone in the you know police officer's room but look at what the police officer's done to that kid this guy's fucking horrible so you you know i mean like she's she's gonna get her vengeance on that guy and that guy's pretty bad so in that in that war i'm siding with extina but at the same time she's she's still She's still going to cause all manner of fucking mayhem yeah. if she wins and succeeds. And that's the beautiful quandary of the show, is that they, they're they like, here she is. You know what she's aiming for. It has been evident from the beginning. But we're going to show you all the way through this that it's not as simple as, wait for it, black and white with any character in this one. There are shades of grey. And Xena's shades of grey are very grey. Um, yeah. And she's like, every every scene, I think, once again, fucking phenomenal actress every scene i'm just like what 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 is your end game i think i know what it is but what is your end game and we'll find out why atticus knew about this specific right later on uh, i keep forgetting you can't see the the quotation marks um but the specific right that he mentions that she kind of tongue-in-cheek replies back to him and with context later on there's a reason that she it's kind of like, you know, I'm going to do what all of them can do, and that is make myself immortal. Mm. Uh, because the very person she's saying it to might be the catalyst for that. So, sure. And she doesn't think that he knows. But Bo, we know that he knows that she doesn't know that he knows. Right. That, like, in most cases, Extina knows more than anyone else knows. Yeah. But, but this in the case is... of this one, she, do, like, she doesn't, like, because Atticus knows... He knows what the end game is. Yes. He knows how it's going to play out. And yes, and he knows her plans for him mm-hmm. in in a way that she doesn't realize he knows. And yeah. And that by, by her giving that information over to him, what she doesn't really realize is he's actually protecting himself from her. Yeah. Yeah. That, yes. Clever move. Clever, it's a shrewd move. Clever girl. Uh, the result of it is. <laughs> It's a clever girl moment, isn't it? Clever girl. Uh, is it like, <laughs> it's like, Nedry, please, God damn it! I hate all this heck of shit. Ah, 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 you got to say the magic word. <laughs> Which is like the square. It's like the square that he has to draw. And by the way, that scene we're going to get to, the, the in, 
invocation of this fucking ceremony is amazing. Uh, oh, it's the best. It's yeah. so fucking, so fucking good. But yeah, like, so we're, we're setting up these, we're setting up these ideas, this power play that one character knows, but the audience doesn't quite know yet. And the other character thinks that they know everything, but they don't actually know everything yet. Yeah. So all right. Good. So, all right, oh. we're going to, we're going to leave them to go to the horror movie of this episode where (laughs) where montrose uh finally found d at home he's like hey you're back what were you doing out there alone mister and (laughs) she's like you're lying to me about my mother and i know she's dead and d runs and locks herself in the bathroom while montrose after dropping an f-bomb to montrose who suddenly remembers that he is the parent in this situation. Well, and he goes full Montrose where he's pounding yeah. on the door. He's like, listen, well, he you open this door, mister. He only knows the one style of parent. Well, so. but he does kind of chill for a second. He's like, look, uh, it's about time you learned how the world works. I know it's rough, but sometimes white people kill your friends. Yeah, let, let me tell you this little story about the way the world works that will chill you to the bone. Like oh like this this is a rite of passage. One of your friends will die at the hands of a white man, and you just have to live with it because that's what it means to be black. Right. Um. Meanwhile, she's scrubbing at her forehead. Um. And this is a fucking amazing scene. Um. So this is this Uncle Tom book that you're talking about, or Uncle Tom phrase. Uncle Tom's on a, cabin. Yes. Yeah. So there's a book in the background, and it has a drawing of what you would presume is like a, a girl of the uh, color and a, a white girl. And as she's putting on a baseball cap and sneakers, um, she catches a, a like a glimpse of something in the book. The book falls over, and when she turns, well, she catches a glimpse of the book, and the 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 faces have morphed into. I would like it is is this what I could think of, like when I saw it? But it was also a combination of like, did you ever, did you ever listen to the Apex Twin? No, no right. So there's a there's this there's this guy a DJ called the Apex Twin, right? And he does it's kind of electronic, it's very bizarre kind of electronic garage music, and he's widely credited as creating maybe the most disturbing music video of all time, which is called "Come to Daddy," which is like a phrase from Hellraiser, which he kind of uses in the song. Um, and what makes it really if you want to see a horror movie music video. It's that. It's Come to Daddy by the Apex Twin. Everyone should check it out. It came out in the 90s. And um, the the music video, and most of his music videos, he superimposes his face like overcatch. So everyone is wearing a mask of his face. And it's fucking horrific to see because it's a lot of little, it's like a, like a, basically a guy walking through like the like, kind of alleyways of this housing estate. And he's been chased by little girls and like pigtails and like kind of almost the shining like you ca- hello Danny that that kind of outfit loads of them but all these little girls have his face his, his demonic face with the goatee beard and the and it's fucking terrifying and in the back it's like I want your soul like come to Daddy like this fucking like hellscape this is delivered and that is what I thought of when I saw. The reveal of what this book is showing is this is like nightmare fucking feel. This is the sort of stuff that you, as a kid, you dream of that like causes night terrors and sleepless nights for a month. It's the sort of shit that keeps your parents up because you won't let them sleep. Um, and she runs out. Montrose comes in, checks the book. Guess what, Bo? Nothing wrong with the book. Nah, so it's, it's all fine. in her head. Is it all in her head, Bo? Maybe we'll find out. Yeah, it's terrifying though. That's what I'm saying. It's fucking terrifying is what I'm saying. It's like a combination between fucking Pennywise the Clown and the Apex Twin video Come to Daddy, which I hope everyone checks out before the next recording and thank me now for the nightmares that will be in just from watching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those visuals seem really upsetting. And uh, so we, we move over to Ruby, who is returning home uh, after, or, you know, back to William slash Extina's place. Um, after, you know, looking for D and all the, the chaos with the funeral and she drops her keys on the way in and there's this white dude in a pickup, uh, across the street. And William, of course, lives in a very nice house in a very white neighborhood. 
And the south, not the south side, the north side. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the dude across the street is like, excuse me, you the maid? Yeah. And Ruby uh-huh. says, no, I ain't the damn maid. And the dude is like, what did you say to me? And starts coming across the street towards her. And Ruby's just like, oh, fuck, this is about to get ugly. And before things can get too far, William, in quotes, arrives home. (laughs) And William, uh, you know, tells the guy like, hey, no, everything's fine here. Thanks, Thanks for looking out for my place, but this is all cool. And when he goes to Ruby, she's just crying. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ruby says he looked like a monster. And then maybe the coolest cover of "I Put a Spell on You" I've ever heard Which we've plays. Already heard, like because we've had the Manson cover, yeah, earlier on this one. But the cover in this one's fucking amazing. It's like a really, really, really good version. As we're going to get, like, because we get this jarring image of Ruby with uh, blue eyes, um, as. She's already drank the potion as the pigmentation in her skin starts to change to white. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, William's in the background. And instead of how they have fucked before, because uh, they should be fucking, um, where, you know, it's been Ruby as Ruby, uh, she's now as white racist lady. Yeah, Hillary. And uh, Hillary Davenport. Hillary Davenport. And Hillary Davenport likes to be on top. So he gets you a bit of jiggly. Davenport nakedness and they are going to town and though I'm thinking to myself well it's another sex scene I'm enjoying it but I've seen a few in this Lovecraft country by now and whilst I do advocate that you should be fucking I feel that if we're going to do this on the screen you have to bring something new to the table and it's almost as if the show heard me and was like that what's that Duncan something you've never seen before enjoy this pray tell and tell the listeners out there what unfolds on the screen yeah, so William kind of rips her skin a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, gives her a good old, you know, fucking scratch along the back. <laughs> fucking scratch. Yeah. And then she just starts to fall apart. Mm-hmm. And it, I think this is what you were referencing earlier, but like... I've as- never seen anything like this in my entire life. And it is like, like horror movies can't do a scene as well as this. And yeah. it makes me wonder why I've never seen a scene like this. It is as close to Hellraiser as you will ever see. I know I'm referencing that again, but it is as close to the kind of ooey gooey, ooh, but oh, this is quite sexy. Like if Clyde Barker had directed this scene, it would not have surprised me one second. I will tear your orgasm apart. <laughs> go with orgasm instead of the obvious one which is I'll tear your hole apart uh, uh, I mean? it's too obvious I like yeah. I like your style you're like I'm class this up a little bit yeah uh, uh, but, you know me yeah. I'm a suit and tie kind of guy but yeah I, I, she goes through the transformation essentially during this as chunks of her flesh fall off the, to reveal you know Ruby underneath which and it's just so bloody and gooey and gross but so fucking sexy it's unbelievable the top of her head kind of mm-hmm. slides back a little bit at one point. <laughs> like she's been scalped. Yeah, but it's just revealing Ruby beneath. It's like the effects on this show, sh- they shouldn't work as well as they do for being a television show, but it looks yep. so good. I says this HBO money, man, honestly. Oh, man, they are, they are putting their money in the right places. This thing looks fucking good. And I also <laughs> like the fact that uh, the lady who plays Hillary, um, a little bit of an older lady, getting fucking mm-hmm. down on screen. I like the fact that Lovecraft Country is like, you over 40? Don't sweat it. Get get yeah. down here and fuck. That's what yeah. Lovecraft Country wants. Do you know, Do you know? Like, because we mentioned Misha Green directed, this is our only directing credit. That's crazy, man. It's fucking nuts, man. This is the only thing she's ever directed. I mean, I'm going to hate it when she leaves this show, but she is on to (laughs) bigger and better things. Like, she, like, the the self-assured, yeah. All right, go (laughs) ahead. The self-assuredness of the direction in this episode is fucking jaw-dropping for a first-time director. What do you mean? She's written a lot, but first-time director. This is her just doing her, I could take a stab at, oh, yeah, I'll just take episode eight. (laughs) Because not a lot happens in that that could go fucking wrong while filming it. 
Um, oh, it's so good, man. This show rules so hard. It's jaw droppingly good. I mean, it's like, and it doesn't at this stage. Like, I feel like the dickhead pointing out how fucking good it is. You know what I mean? Like, like, oh, it's it's good like that. I, I feel like because I I I don't know if the people making this know how fucking just completely genre defining this is. I don't know if they do or if they're just making another HBO TV show because it really is. It operates on such a different level. This is the, the sort of this is what the fucking this is what Pinhead describes as pain and pleasure indivisible. Uh, when you see this on the screen, that that is from the fucking mind of Clyde Barker on the screen. I have never seen even in a even in a movie. I've never seen a scene like this, execute like this, where the effects, what shouldn't work, work, and the actors are fucking incredible in it. Yeah. And it just, and you've got the score over the background, and it's fucking am- everything. Right, like the climax of this, I put a spell on you cover and everything, you're just like, God damn, this is good. <laughs> it's just a different, it's just, it operates in a completely different plane. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing that does what this show does. Yeah, it kind of makes it like every time I watch one of these episodes, I just want to punch somebody right in the face. Like, God, <laughs> this is so good, I hate it. Um, like it, it, it ruins other shows for me. Every other show should be this good because it can be done. Um, but anyway, so we there's a, a quick cutaway where Atticus shows up at the boarding house and sees Gia shoes outside, <laughs> and he's like, "Ah, oh, right." There's a the real uh, fuck. Yeah. So, this is all I need. Please tell me Letty's not home. Please tell me Letty's not on the Letty's home. And they're sitting at the table together. Yeah. Neither one of them's talking, which means they have talked. And yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Like nobody <laughs> says a word. And then we cut away. Mm-hmm. And which I like. Just like, you know what? Things are tense at the Letty household. <laughs> We're going to cut back to D. Surely things will be lighter over here. Oh yeah, like, oh, th- dude, when this scene happened, I, like, there was no, like, I'm watching this show myself, I've told my wife as soon as I finish episode 10, the two of us are going back through it from scratch, because I know that she's going to fucking love it, um, but I'm too far into it to go back, and um, when I saw this scene, I hit pause on the TV, and I was, I, I was bouncing on the couch, I was that fucking excited for something as traumatic as this, it's just... It's everything I love about horror, like in a scene yeah. right now. That, that yeah. idea of someone seeing something that they can't, you know, no one else can see, but what they are seeing is like, like the worst thing that that person could see. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, from, from our perspective. Also, like it leans back into, was I way back in the day, um, I want to say it was Bravo did that 100 greatest horror movie moments. Mm -hmm. And in that, if memory serves, they had a Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And I know what you're thinking, Duncan, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. (laughs) Why would that? And it's the child catcher um, who's like immensely fucking creepy and terrified me as a kid. Uh, Hello, children. You know, like as he's like dancing about the place. And that was the thing, like what made him terrifying is he moved. He was, I think in real life, he was a ballet dancer. He's a German ballet dancer, and they cast him in the role, and as a result, he prances the way he walks, and it somehow makes him even more terrifying. Yeah. Because there's this like evil grace in the way he walks. And they take that and insert that 100 percent of this episode. And it's why those kids are so fucking creepy. Um she's waiting on a train. Mm-hmm. And the the train ain't coming, Bo. And the camera's at a weird position where we can see right along the line of all the passengers and into the dark stairwell <laughs> is leading up to the platform, and um, something happens. But I, I feel that you're best placed to articulate it because I've had a drink. Yeah. So as we're looking down this dark set of stairs, we see this like girlish figure walking backward up the steps, mm-hmm. and it's sort of like a, a one leg has these pippy long stockings leggings on the other's bare it's this tattered kind of sundress um this nappy hair that's reminiscent of the the cover of the uncle tom book which Mm -hmm. we see uh is accurate because as this girl backs up the stairs and then stops and then out jumps a second girl (laughs) from the first that you never saw before 
Mm -hmm. And then the girl who has jumped out, who has these like, like luminescent yellow eyes and this wide mouth and these jagged teeth. And it's just horrifying. And she whispers something to the other girl who bends backwards (laughs) where in one of those, like, Oh, that that's not how that's supposed to work. Yeah. Um, Your your back's not supposed to go that way. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, and also has this like, you know, devilish grin and these glowing yellow eyes. And D as a random white dude, like, Hey, do you see this? And he's like, no, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And this creepy, like old 1930 song that sounds like, uh, much like, the the song that the uh, lodge owner lip syncs to in Winter Beast, yeah, in terms, so as <laughs> in, in terms of just being this kind of creepy nineteen teens kind of song or something, yeah. And it's playing as they're coming closer, and it's like, let me in, let me in, and they're dancing in this awful glee. And as they reach for, uh, the nails get longer. Yeah, as the- it turns out the song is called "Stop That Knocking," um, and it's performed by Peter Desanti, Brian Mark, David Van Beersblick, which you know, whoever was an American name, that's that, uh, and Roger Smith. Um, and there is no like link to it or anything like that, but the song is called "Stop That Stop That Knocking," um, and they danced it. Fucking creepily while walking. I, I mean, it really is the kind of there is a kind of Pennywise the clown sort of thing going on with them. And like Pennywise the clown was the twins from The Shining. That's kind of what this is. Yeah. Um. It's so fucking jarring, and like obviously she's desperate to get out of there. The trains are cancelled. There's like some power outage, and she tries to push past. And we start to see that the nails on these girls start to grow into almost like Freddy claws. Um. As she's trying to escape, and she just makes it out, but we now know that this is what the curse spell is. And Duncan is like, "Ah, it's not that pictures are spine. He's actually put a like, you know, the sin of the old curse, death curse. Um, <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> uh, like literally, she has a death curse on her, and it's it follows esque in that, like, wherever she goes, these fuckers are gonna just like dance and prance all the way up until they get her. Yeah, and like this never ending." curse that that follows her and they yeah. are credited in the uh on the imdb as topsy and bopsy yeah there's uh, yeah they should be known as like terrifying and punching um <laughs> but because that is literally what they are as like it's this sort of stuff like like i see there's a there's a kind of it's just so fucking like it, it is like some it's like they took the the creepy others from us and morphed them with the shining and a bit of pennywise the clown and then made them dance with, with uh, and just a I'd, just a hint of baba's demons yes yes and then i'd like and they will act exactly like they do and it follows um yeah and it's like a weird bl- it's a smoothie <laughs> of all this served up and it's just it's, it works so fucking well and it is so unsettling like every time the comes I'm like oh no <laughs> yeah I mean it's like you said it's just it's it's the appearance it's the movement it's the song like it's just it, it's just a nightmare brought to life yeah it's a night it's a nightmare milkshake um and- yeah <laughs> um and uh no matter how much you suck oh. you, you still just need to give it about five minutes before you it's can the really same it's the same reaction that uh, Vincent Vega has when he realizes it's a five dollar milkshake at that <laughs> restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> fucking was, five dollars. That's pretty good milkshake. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty good nightmare. <laughs> so we cut back to the boarding house where things uh, have not gotten less tense. Mm-hmm. As uh, Gia is telling uh, Letty and Atticus, explaining what a succubus. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, yeah, Atticus says succubus, and she's like, eh, Camillo, you know, yeah. six of one, half Camillo of the other. Yeah, it's, it's like a demon nine-tailed fox. And yeah. they're like, yeah, okay then. And then he's like, I love the fact that he's like, he instantly kicks in with a, you know, so you've slept with a hundred men, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking to myself, Atticus, you are in no position <laughs> to fucking throw any accusations anywhere. This woman wants to sleep with a hundred men, she can fucking sleep with a hundred men. 
You bite the fuck off. Well, no, he says, you killed a hundred men. Yeah. <laughs> and then she says, yeah, that's my nature. What's your excuse? And yeah, he's just like, ah. She's like, you want some, you you want some antiseptic for that sick burn, I guess? <laughs> oh, let me, let me offer you some <laughs> cool compresses and moisture wipes for the burn that this comijo just gave you. On the count of you saying stupid shit to me. <laughs> but like, she, she explains, she explains, this is what got me giggling. She explains, she's like, yeah, like wh- when I'm having, when I'm, when I'm making the, the fuck with a man and the <laughs> climax, um, you know, I get, like, that's, that's when it triggers it. And like, as I'm killing them, I get to see their entire life up to the point of when they die. Um, but you know, obviously, and Atkins is like, "Well, you know, how did I die?" And she's like, "Well, I don't know." He said, like, "Well, when is it going to happen?" And she's like, ah, "I don't know." <laughs> like, yeah. like, uh, come back later. Ask again later. The, yeah, is it, it's like, it's future the future unclear. She's the magic magic eight ball of of, of mystical comijo answers. Um, where he's like, "Well, like you know, like you can't tell me like you know, when I'm going to die. You can't tell me how I'm going to die. You know, what? Why the fuck are you even here?" And I'm like, she just travelled halfway across the world to come and see you. And this is how you're going to treat her. And of course, Letty boils it down to a nice concise point that we all know because we saw that episode. And that is simply, she's over here because she's still in love with you. Yeah. And she's like, right, I'm getting up. So Letty goes in a little, you know, a little strop. She's going to go upstairs and get the fuck out of Dodge, can pack her bags and all the rest. And then Atticus does what I consider personally is a very cruel thing um yeah he gets hereditary on her <laughs> don't you ever fucking swear at me i'm your fucking mother yeah where he he whispers to her our shit wasn't real yeah. i'm not dying get the fuck out and you're like whoa yeah you just told uh a, a nine-tailed demon Get the fuck out. That's some balls, yeah. Atticus. I respect yeah, I'd be it. Think, yeah, I'd be thinking to myself, with all the shit I've seen, you know what I could use on my side right now? A nine-tailed succubus demon. Yeah. <laughs> on on my side? That'd be pretty good right now as I'm trying to work out spells to protect myself. So <laughs> let me just tell you, Duncan, the next couple of minutes are going to me- be me indulging in the delicious melodrama of this show that I like. Oh, this is fucking. This is oh, this is like uh, one character is going to have their strop, and the other one is going to try desperately to get them back on board, and then it's going to switch very, very, very quickly, and the roles will be reversed. And I'll tell you right now, both sides of it are equally fucking amazing. Yeah. So Atticus follows Letty uh, to her room, where he finds her packing her shit. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where she was going to go, but that is where Letty's head is at. Of, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Yeah, and, like, this is your house, Letty. He should go. <laughs> right. And then she looks at him and says, that bitch needs to go. Mm-hmm. And Atticus is like, she's gone. She is gone, Letty. <laughs> like, calm down. <laughs> she is gone. Already gone. I took care of it. Yeah. She meant nothing to me. Nothing. Yeah. And Letty, very rightfully, is like, you were hiding this shit. And, uh, and, and she says, uh, he's like, look. I don't know what happened to me that night. All I know, I was just trying to protect everybody around me. And that's all I'm trying to do. That's all I've ever been trying to do. And Letty also rightfully points out, <laughs> you were doing a shitty job of this because everyone around you done died. Yeah, everyone everyone around you done died except you. Yeah. Like- <laughs> oh, that stings. And then that's where Atticus is like, you know what? I'm just going to leave. <laughs> so... It's like none of us are living in this house anymore. Yeah, <laughs> where every, everybody's moving out. And then Atticus, as he leaves, Letty now follows him, and it's like, "Where are you going?" And he's like, "I'm going to make this right." And it, so she follows up to his uh, room, mm-hmm. which is kind of covered with notes and spell shit and that kind of thing. And and unsurprisingly, he's like, "Hey, I'm going to cast a spell." Yep. Grabs. She's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, what? A spell? <laughs> yeah. Have we got into this fucking place in the first place? So he gets a gun and his notes, 
and is about to leave. And she, like you said, she's trying to stop him. And he gives her this speech about like, Hey, I'm doing all of this for us. I'm yeah, trying to, amazing. I'm trying to protect our future. And the, the line that probably got you to is when he yeah. yells, we are surrounded by monsters, Letty. Yeah. And it, like, the, like I'm not doing justice how, to how good the delivery of that is where it's just yeah. this anguish of like, I'm just trying to save our lives. It's up there. Honestly, the delivery, and I, I do not see this lightly. It's up there with like the end of training day. And you've got like Denzel, you know, like King Kong ain't yeah. got shit on me. It's that sort of like, it's powerful. There's tears in his eyes. You can feel the anguish is built up to this, you know, like fury and like the despair. It's more despair than anything else. He's not doing this because he wants to do this. This is his only option because he has read the book, the book that we're going to find out why he's behaving the way he is momentarily. But like, he knows something. <laughs> he knows that she doesn't know that he knows what's going to happen. And as a result of that, this is him clutching at straws because he he's fully aware that she's pregnant. She doesn't know that. Um, and he also knows what Extina's intention is. And he is going to do absolutely anything within his power to make sure that he's there to see his kid. Yeah. And... Um, it's, it's fucking brilliant. It's, it, it, once again, like you, like you say, we we focused on all these other great performances, and sometimes it feels like he's been he's been solid throughout the entire show. He's, he's you know, not delivered a bad line or a bad performance, and then he gets his moment to really shine here. And by God, does he deliver it? He also has a very <laughs> yeah. heartwarming scene coming up with his dad shortly, uh, and their whole interaction is fucking amazing. But um, it really is. It's a, it's an a, incredibly powerful scene. Yeah, and, and then he's got. He's gone. You know, like he's like fuck it. Well, and uh, my big complaint with Atticus, and not as he's written or anything, it's just like his character flaw mm. is that Letty is like, you need to stay and tell me what's going on, and I'll help you. We'll get through this together. And Atticus's big Achilles heel is he won't allow anyone to help him. He has to. He's he's dead. Right. He right, he is his father's son. He yeah. he he takes all this responsibility on himself and 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 doesn't realize that he's actually stronger if Letty is by his side. Which has been consistently proved throughout the show that every time she helps and every time they work together great things happen. Yes. But he's not he's what he's like he's dad. He's unprepared to let the guard down for fear that something bad happens. So he won't do it. All right. Duncan, let's get to some, let's leave that cool scene to go mm -hmm. to this cool scene mm -hmm. where Ruby uh, is coming downstairs post-coital to find Extina hanging up uh, saying to someone on the other end of the phone, of course, I'll be there soon. And mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when you, when she says that, it doesn't sound like anything at first, but then later you're like, it's oh, fucking, oh my good God almighty. <laughs> that's who she was talking to. Mm -hmm. And then anyway, Ruby is comes downstairs and tells her the story of Emmett Till and, and says, this is a young kid from the South side, uh, ran afoul of the police. They, uh, they beat him. They shot him. They yep. they used barbed wire as a noose to tie him to like an old alternate or an old engine block or whatever. Yeah, and then threw that into the Tallahatchie River. And, and our next scene is like, oh, I know. Mm -hmm. And Ruby says, like, I know you know, but do you care? And and Xena is like, look, you want me to say yes? And then Ruby's like, no, no, no. I just want you to feel for one second what I feel, mm -hmm. how, how scared and angry and tired. So goddamn tired and alone and shameful. And, and she's like, you're never going to understand that. And, you know, I want you to feel guilty for feeling safe. Mm hmm. And she says, you know, the, the thing that I didn't like about you, you know, pulling the skin <laughs> off back there is she says, today of all days, I didn't want to be a black woman 
fucking a white man. Mm-hmm. And then Extina kind of nods and she says, no. <laughs> and Ruby's like, what? And she says, no, I don't care about Emmett Till or the cops who did it. And I don't think you do either. What I saw upstairs when we were fucking and that's what we were doing <laughs> was somebody being reborn. Yeah. And then Ruby doesn't say a word and Extina leaves. But Which to me speaks volumes. I, <laughs> see, I think we have two different interpretations of this, I think. Yeah. I think Ruby doesn't answer because what she sees is Ex- Extina confirming wh- everything she's just said is that you uh... you don't feel any of this. And I am and she's feeling that what you see on her face is all the stuff that she just expressed being angry and tired and and just fed up and ashamed and all that stuff. Like the one person maybe that she could confide in is just like, I don't care. And you don't either. And, and there's this fundamental misunderstanding between them. Like there, this is the gulf they can't ever bridge. Uh, I see. I, I, I do read it differently because of how she talks about Extina later on in the episode. Right. I, I'm, I'm saying this be only because of what Extina does. later. Right. Right, yeah, I've got you. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. And then we cut to the Nightmare on Elm Street jump rope kids who have escaped <laughs> that movie. They are like at this point, it's just like one, two. Yeah, they just learned a new rhyme, but it's just like you know, if your name is D, you better run and pee, because Topsy and Bobsy are gonna murder you. And be a delicious bit more tame. <laughs> right in the new run. song. <laughs> <laughs> so D shows up at Letty's and Letty is on her way out and she's D's like, hey, I need some help. And Letty's just like, I ain't got time. Like yeah. normally I'm here for it, but I just don't have time today. And D tries to tell her, like, hey, I'm seeing Topsy and Bobsy, the nightmare twins. Mm-hmm. And, but she can't get it out. She kind of chokes when she tries to, to tell Letty. And Letty says, D, just get some water or something. Uh, call Montrose and tell him you're here. Mm-hmm. And then she takes off to parts unknown for now. And uh, then D sees Topsy and Bobsy, sure enough. And um, then as she's running away from that, D discovers Woody. Yep. And is like, hey, wait a second. But before she can really register and investigate, Topsy and Bobsy show up at the window of the car. And And a terrifying scene that made me almost shit my pants. (laughs) Yeah. And the horrible song starts up again and they they chase Dee away. And then we, we leave her being terrorized by Topsy and Bobsy, which... Like, these scenes are incredible, and they're atmospheric, and they're terribly frightening. But mm-hmm. it's hard to communicate that, so we're just trusting. Yeah, we, we, have to, we have to just go through it. Like, you, like seeing is believing. They're really fucking well done. Yeah. And there's just, it is nightmare fuel. Right. It really it, is. Right, it's like explaining why Wreck is scary. You know, it's yeah. like, you just, just watch Wreck, and you'll see. Um, the old woman, the old woman <laughs> Like, yeah, that's why. Like you explain it all, and someone's like, "That doesn't sound that scary." And then you sit them down with it, and you see the PTSD, like post that scene, yeah. <laughs> just wash over them. And you're like, "Yeah, you're like what? The world will seem different after this now." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, this gets worse. Yeah, all of this yeah. will get worse as the movie goes. Enjoy, and yeah, also like, you go- <laughs> keep an eye out for the hammer. Yeah, when you <laughs> like, like post wreck the first the first breath of air that you have outside. Of a building where you've seen Wrecking will be the sweetest air that you've ever tasted. <laughs> and you realize that you've just experienced one of the most terrifying things in solar movie. Um, like you'll look at the world slightly differently. <laughs> yeah, like like life affirming and changing in equal measure. But yeah, like these scenes really are. But we can't do them justice, and you really need to check them out. And we are going to be returning to them at least twice uh, before the end of this episode with more Topsy and what did you say? Topsy and Bobsy. Top scene, bop scene. So yeah, we will be returning to that. So, and it doesn't get any easier. <laughs> no, it, it just gets worse. And then mm. on the south side, uh, we, we cut to Montrose, who is drinking on the stoop. 
uh, I love it. having gloriously love it. fucked up today. Yeah, I also think like there's something about like American sort of curbs that just look instantly sittable. Like in the UK, the curbs are not that high up. Yeah. Um. So you can't really like you if you sat in them, you might as well just sit in the road. Uh. But the, these American ones here, it's a proper like stoop place. I'm just gonna sit here and I'm gonna have a drink and mm-hmm. and maybe someone will sit beside me. And maybe we'll have a chat. And I love that. We, you we, guys got that right. Yes, we we have our problems, but there is a, there is a charm to American culture when done right. Yeah. And uh, and the stoop and curb is right up there yes definitely so uh atticus arrives and montrose says uh d snuck out on me again god damn it and <laughs> tick tick is like hey did you ever cheat on mama and montrose uh gets real with him for a bit and he's like i never did not while we were married i had urges but i waited till after she died mister <laughs> and then tick uh like sits down beside his father as a step yeah out right right on the on the curb and um mantra says you know when i was a kid there was a preacher back home he got caught in the woods with a dude the community really got riled up about it next thing you know somebody was showing up to take him to the loony bin mister they lobotomized him it mm. sucked and <laughs> And Montrose basically tells him, like, I decided I was going to have a life. Like, I wasn't going to be the person, whatever urges I had, I wasn't going to be the person that got taken off to the the nervous hospital mm-hmm. and lobotomized for the who I loved. And so sh- when he met his, uh, Tick's mother, she was coming off of the Tulsa riots. Uh, her She'd lost most of her family. And... Um, she just wanted somebody safe. They both wanted to raise a family, he says, you know, and, um, he says it wasn't romantic, but familial love is the strongest. Yeah. And as they're talking, the, the lights on the street go out and then tick takes the drink from his father and has a drink. And he, uh, he says, you know, Letty's pregnant. And ladies and gents, get ready because we are about to drop a big, big old massive amount of exposition here, which made me go, oh, I get it now. Yeah. And as soon as it was dropped, I was like, oh, I get it now. And instantly there was this wash of relief that kind of flooded over me where I suddenly, it's the, like you mentioned jokingly earlier on, the lost scenario where I'm like that, right? Everything does have a purpose and we know what that purpose is. And that, you know... To me, is the concern with these shows is you're giving me all this cool shit, but does it tie up? Can you bring it all back and will it have a satisfying conclusion, or will I be sitting here like with a bug in my brain for the next year going, but this bit didn't make sense? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, and as soon as we get this this info dump, I was like, right, I'm, yeah, I'm you, I am on board, a hundred percent. Give me all this. Um, I am, you know. I, I'm now recommitting my love for this show as much as I already had. I'm I'm doubling I'm doubling my efforts because how does he know that Lady is pregnant, Bo? Well, it turns out, Duncan, that when he fell into that rift in the last episode, he went to the future. Gotta go back in time. And has a book called Lovecraft Country mm-hmm. that was written by George Freeman, his son. Naughty's uncle. <gasps> dun dun dun. <laughs> and so we, after that bomb is dropped, we cut immediately to Letty in church. Mm-hmm. And it's weird, Duncan, but there's something incredibly sexy even when Journey Smollett is praying. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you had that reaction, but I was like, ah, this feels. Highly erotic for some reason. (laughs) Should I feel guilty about masturbating to her in a church? Right. Praying, emotionally praying. (laughs) While she's like bearing her soul to the Lord. Does this feel appropriate? It's too late. I'm already there. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And so Exena enters behind her as she's praying. And, And the thrust of her prayer is she is praying for protection for Atticus. As he mm. casts this spell, she says, you know, God, put your armor around him. And then she adds a PS. 
about Emmett Till's family. Like, mm-hmm. you know, watch over them. An- another mention of Emmett Till that Extina is overhearing and, and thinking mm-hmm. about. So, Go on, Bo. Yeah, oh, it's goddamn the show. Because the, the like, because the 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 upshot of this is something that is horrifically violent and at the same time amazingly crafted. So yeah, it's <laughs> oh, it's so good. And um, so they they sit down, or Xena sits down beside Letty, and it's like, I didn't think you were much of a praying person. And Le- Letty is like, Well, I wasn't, but then you know, I came back from the dead and all. And that kind of sent me back to church and they, they kind of talk about, you know, well, uh, my father thought he was God, Mm -hmm. you know, he thought all the power he had and the influence he had over people made him a God, but he was just a dude. (laughs) And, you know, she says like, you kind of, you have to have immortality and also an understanding that God is both God and the devil, that he is both Mm -hmm. things. And which is kind of an interesting take on Extina herself because she kind of is both those things too. She is both villainous, but also does things that seem to be very positive. Yeah. And um, so Letty wants to make Atticus invulnerable in exchange for the negatives of the the pictures that she took of the the pages, Hiram's pages. And Extina takes her hand and says. No, I'm not going to protect him, but I'll protect you. Mm-hmm. And then Letty pulls her hand away and and starts to leave. Uh, or, or Xena, like when she pulls her hand away, Xena gets up and she's just like, well, all right, fine then. And then starts to leave. And then Letty's like, wait. And Xena comes back and is like, oh, did you want something? <laughs> And this scene is so hot. And then uh she she holds her hand out to Letty. Letty takes it. And then Extina gives this incantation. And then uh Letty feels this pain in her side and kind of doubles over, and then when she looks, there is this like a uh, a mark on her skin. Yeah, it's kind of like Abraham's head. Yeah. Sort of mark. And Extina says, yeah, that's the mark of Cain. I was the first person to realize you could use to heal somebody. And this, I this, I realized here that this show also scratches a little bit of a, the craft itch to me. Yeah. <laughs> where it's like, oh, I like all this witchcraft shit too. Because like as yeah. she's leaving, Letty whips her head around and is like, oh my God, I got marked by Cain in the house of the Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, I've done become evil and shit. Yeah. And then we cut back to D, who is uh, on her bike at night. Having a great time. Man, all right, so she's trying to get into the police station, and she ah, has... She's in a dark alley opposite the police station, and the camera's at an angle where I know for a fact those creepy fuckers are going to appear behind her. Yeah, and then they do <laughs> eyes first. You know, where they, like you see these yellow eyes kind of pop out of the darkness, and then yeah. there they are, and you're like, stop yep. it! Um, we are Siamese, if you please. <laughs> it, there's a hint of that. Yeah, there it is totally some of that. It fucking is. Yeah. Disney's fucking warped. Like, and the, that, all that old Disney cartoon shit is terrifying. Right, there's always a scene in it where I'm like that. Right, why is this? Or like, who thought this was acceptable for kids? Sure. But there is, like, total, the way they are moving is fucking 100% that. Yeah, and it, and again, it's those yellow glowing eyes and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's, oh, yeah, we're 100% on brand here. And mm-hmm. then D uh, just escapes their claws as as they uh, come close behind her, and sh- and she yeah. keeps going. So we cut. She's gonna yeah, she's gonna follow them to the clubhouse, right? And so we we leave her to go back to Montrose and and Tick, who are at his place <laughs> setting up amazing. this spell. <laughs> this is one of my favorite scenes in the whole episode. And Montrose is like. Boy, you shouldn't have given Extina that key. That seems real stupid. And Tick is like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. The machine's broke. And uh, so he says, look, I was only in the future for a second. But then this woman with a hood and a robotic arm 
mm-hmm. gave him this book and shoved him back through the portal while white people were rioting, which is the most rocking description of anything. Yeah, there's a total burn him out. Yeah. So I don't know like that, you know what I mean? And Tick is like, uh, yeah, I, you know, I read it. And uh, it's our family story. I mean, some of the details are different. Or and, are they, boo? Well, all right. So here's the thing <laughs> that I read on the IMDb, Duncan, mm-hmm. is that all the differences that he's detailing are the differences between the book and the television show. Oh, the show is fucking amazing. Which is, I think, really clever. And, like, there's a thing where he's like, well, D's actually a boy named Horace and, you know, that kind of thing. And that's all just, that's what was in the book. Oh, so. that's so clever. <laughs> yeah, that's isn't like, that good? That's, that's like having, like, Stephen King appear in your second It movie and constantly talk about jokes about how the character, who the writer is, uh, can't finish a book. <laughs> can't finish a book satisfyingly. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that sort of in, in sort of thing, that kind of meta in joke. Ah, that makes a whole lot more sense now because my theory post this was that things out with, you know, like D being like a like a boy were changeable things, like Uncle George was going to come back. Sure. And uh, it makes more sense now, and I actually prefer that. I think that's quite clever. But also, it, it could be that they also use it as like, oh, these are just alternate realities that are out there, like Hippolyta mm-hmm. saw. Like I'm, I'm done with all of it. Yeah, so we <laughs> could, all. You know, I could still come back. God damn it! And I think he. Pro- I, I, I would like to think he will. Yeah, I just because I like that character so much, and I would love, mm. I would love to see a post episode seven Hippolyta with George. Yeah, well, she's she took his hand, so yeah. he is now traveling with her. Oh, so. wouldn't that be great if he if she comes back with George? Mm-hmm. Oh fuck, Duncan. Mm-hmm. She oh. brought him back. Hang on, I'm gonna need about five minutes. We're gonna pause the show, everybody. <laughs> no, um. So <laughs> like, the, like there, there's a, a traumatic scene with those little girls attacking D, and then this portal opens and you're bat, bat in it, bat in it. <laughs> you know, like, like give me that. She, she comes back with her like you know Amazon sword. George has a oh, ray gun. But- yeah, just like <laughs> just a reek. Right? <laughs> Shooting the Shoggoths and Yeah, I need that. I need that. Mike. I mean, that's not the craziest thing we would have seen on this show. No, see if the show did that, I would feel organic. <laughs> right. Like if that happened, it would just be like a totally metal moment in a metal mm-hmm. series, you know? Mm-hmm. Um anyway, so Tick is like, yeah, I, it turns out I die when Extina sacrifices me to become a mortal in five days at the equinox. Yeah, and that, yeah, and that particular phrase that he mentioned to Extina earlier on. Yeah. And Montrose, like, at this point, Montrose steps the fuck up. Oh, though. dude. He says, I always thought I'd die by a white man's bullet or the end of a rope. Magic's so much more jazz. <laughs> oh what a fucking line and then Atticus kind of cries like he's like man my dad's stepping up uh, you know yeah. it's like they finally feel like a family more than they ever have on this show mm-hmm. and then Montrose says you know you said something about spells requiring intention and it is my intention to save my son and grandson no matter what mister and it's pretty good stuff man this scene is like again, it's just nice to see these characters growing and mm-hmm. and, and becoming like a real like our our the good guys are starting to gel, you know, yeah. and in preparation for our final showdown. And uh, so then we speaking of people just doing awesome and and saying awesome things, <laughs> we go to Lancaster at the club where mm-hmm. he is. Discussing with one of his flunkies the practicality of going after Letty because he's like, hey, we don't know how much magic she knows. And or if any. And B, she's also something of a celebrity for opening up this boarding house and doing all this pioneering. And then D just busts into the room and is like, Is my mother dead? And Lancaster goes, uh, probably. Yep. <laughs> and she says, what did you do to me with all the spit and whatnot? 
And what if these things get me? And he says, look, you bring me the Ori and I'll take this curse off of you. Do you know what an Ori is? (laughs) And she's like, like, she like opens up 100%. I kind of let it whip us. Yeah. She's like, I, of course I know what an Ori is. Also, my mother's name is Greek asshole. (laughs) And then she spits on Lancaster's tie. Calls him a pig. Says, fuck you, pig. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Starts walking out of the place and on her way out the door, just throws over her shoulder and it fucking stinks in here. Yeah. And takes off. Then the dead Kennedys play. Someone oh, yes. throws a lit garbage can through the window. <laughs> It is, like you say, is the most punk rock shit to happen. Yeah, of course it is. Like, and this is where I'm like, that D is my MVP of this. <laughs> yeah, speaking of speaking of the, the nut falling far from the tree, there's plenty mm-hmm. of Hippolyta in D. Oh, yes. And, yes. Ain't a whole hell of a lot of... There's the... the, the I wouldn't say that. The Hippolyta is a very smart woman as well, but there's a, the, the well-versed academia and reading of George... Right now, and a whole lot of swagger from Hippolyta. Yeah. Uh, it's fucking awesome. And and so Lancaster, you know, watching her leave says, all right, enough shit. I'm going to go get what's mine. Yeah. And then. That's what you think. Tee-hee. <laughs> yeah. Tee-hee. Um, as D storms out, though, they play this speech from a, a young woman named Naomi Wilder, um, mm-hmm. who spoke at the March for Our Lives rally in rally in 2018 Mm -hmm. and it is it is a young black girl saying hey we are the victims nobody talks about like we're the the unseen victims of america yeah and d uh bikes away as the creatures are terrorizing her and she like once behind her once in front of her and she just lets out speaking to hippolyta a hippolyta-esque roar and then just speeds past. The, yeah, the, please check him with a demon. That's it's, it's kind of amazing, and she wins. Yeah, yeah, because because D ain't nothing to fuck with, and mm-hmm. so <laughs> just wait till she gets a pipe. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get. Yeah, <laughs> but all right. So we then we come back to Ticket Montrose actually doing this fucking spell. <laughs> you got a great like reveal here <laughs> of like Montrose not understanding incantation. Yeah, and like. <laughs> Like, 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 text, like, I mean, it totally makes sense, like, that you know, like, if you, if you, maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense if you're swapping words. And uh, Watch was like, Yeah, I, like, I do that sometimes. And he's like, What do you mean you do that sometimes? He's like, Well, I'm dyslexic. And he's like, Since when? <laughs> it's like, Since I was a kid. Yeah. And Tick, Tick has a funny line here where he says, You keep any other secrets for me? <laughs> and it, but it's a real light thing. But Montrose looks a little guilty here. Probably yeah. because he kind of suspects that George is Atticus's father. So there is a, a, a larger secret kind of floating out there. Yeah, 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 definitely. But, eh, you know, but I, Atticus is is definitely not, like, getting on his case about it or nothing. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of funny. And they start uh, the spell. And, like, Atticus draws the, the uh, symbol on the floor and steps inside it. And Montro starts reciting it, and he's like, "All right, here's the spell." <laughs> Duck lock, fuck. <laughs> Does the spell in it? Like <laughs> At the end of it, though, he kind of gives it a half second. He's like. Amen. And then does yeah. the <laughs> Right, and Atticus kind of looks at him. He's like, "What? Well, fuck! It can't hurt." You know. <laughs> I. That's really funny, and. <laughs> And and they so then they both just kind of look at each other. So and do you feel anything different? Yeah, I don't know. How, how about you? And he's like, I don't know. And then they're like, Well, it didn't work. Right, we we fucked up. We didn't actually do anything. Maybe it didn't fuck up. Tee tee. <laughs> Meanwhile, down at the pier, Duncan. Oh, that scene. By the way, fuck's sake. So. Uh, Extina is, is down at, at some wooden pier with a couple of dudes that she has hired. You know, she's like, yeah, Hey, you got your us, You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And they're like, you sure about this? And she's like, Hey, just do what I hired you to do. 
And so they beat her. Yeah, beat the fucking shit out of her. They shoot her. Right in the stomach. Um. Yeah, and she coughs up blood, and I mean, yeah, she's yeah, it's gnarly. Yeah. Then they uh, tie a noose of barbed wire around her neck. Yep, which doesn't look nice at all. And and tie that to this, you know, piece of machinery, mm-hmm. and toss it into the river. Yep. And there is this amazing shot of the barbed wire uncoiling and then she is just unceremoniously yanked yeah off the pier leaving trail of blood yeah Yeah. leaving only a trail of blood yep and then um and and the guys are like it's a fucking crazy way to die it's not how (laughs) i'd want to go and then they fuck off yeah and once they fucked off extina because you know she's got an invulnerability here we are, um, born to the kings. <laughs> I am a martyr. <laughs> um, but sh- she like comes out of the water, like weeping and laughing, and it's just th- this is why I think all this stuff that Ruby said to her, and and even over here, yeah, and- like there's there's a yeah there's a I think we are. I was tackling it from the other position i wasn't taking it from extina's position i was talking about ruby's intention sure and her reaction which and the scene coming up very soon where she's basically professing but not only am i living with her she's gonna teach me magic and yeah. all the rest and the like is that the sort of thing you'd be saying after having this huge weighty heartful conversation where you realize that the person that you really need to rely on doesn't actually have the same feelings or, you know, understand you on that level if you're still prepared to go through with everything that she's laid out as a thing. So maybe they're both right and maybe they're both wrong. Yeah, uh, and and that's the kind of characters on this show that aren't, you know, like, that's commonplace is characters to be sort of both good and bad. Like, everybody's, yeah. no, nobody is purely a hero or a villain. Yeah, I like that. I, like I do that too. Idea. Maybe Lancaster. I guess Lancaster fucking... doesn't really have anything going for him. No. <laughs> He's just kind of an asshole. Yeah, and I would like to see he gets his comeuppance, but I think he might leave just before the comeuppance happen. We'll get to it. Um, well, I wasn't yeah, sure we'll if see. He was, I wasn't sure if he was one of the ones that... Well, we'll get to it. Yeah, well, um... so we're almost there, but... <laughs> So, um, but it, it, it's a really brutal scene and it, it, it's striking, it's horrific. but it, it also, I think for me, I, I like the fact that, that Xtina is like, okay, well, if I don't understand, let me, let me experience oh, it because yeah, it I'll doesn't cost me anything. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's also the second scene in this episode where men have brutalized the women. So like D being like dragged to the ground, hoisted up, spat on and all the rest It's yeah. Like the, the, this show's not scared to do that. A lot, a lot of shows would back away from that. Specifically, twice in one episode, and they, you know, the the I I really it's, it's a bold thing to do, and it's something I appreciate that they're doing as well. So um, it's a great scene, um, and we are now leaving her for the rest of the episode. Yeah, um, um, we're and gonna we'll move... find out what the after effect is in the next one. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, I'm very curious about this. Uh, so Letty is listening to Stormy Weather as mm-hmm. she's in her darkroom basement that she exercised herself with the spirits of the ghosts of the house, <laughs> which uh, at one time was one of the coolest things. Yeah, uh, Basketball player with a baby's head. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, <laughs> back back in mind. those heady days when it was like, oh, this show might be pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, so... She's she took a bunch of pictures at the wake, but it turns out it's just a bunch of pictures of Atticus. And she says, you know, that that boy's mother was brave enough to put his body on display, and yeah. I wasn't brave enough to take a picture of it. And uh and Ruby uh says, Look, you can't feel guilty for protecting yourself first. And uh Letty is like, Yeah, but here's the thing, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and Ruby says, oh, you should have stayed with Marvin instead of following Atticus to Artem. And mm-hmm. then Letty is like, the fuck? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I totally know about magic and what's got, what happened to George. And also, I'm kind of sort of fucking Xtina. 
I love the way they just like this is just like this could have been drawn out into a needless scene and they're like that can condense it down a couple of minutes. Let's just get over the right, you know stuff, I know stuff, let's just let's I think this is brilliant. Yeah, and Letty is like, Are you did she ask you to spy on us? And Ruby's like, No. And Letty uh is like, Well, cause she asked me to spy on on the rest of you fuckers, so like let's not put it above her. Mm-hmm. And Ruby is like, no, 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 you understand. I'm getting magic out of this deal. And all I want, and she's like, I, 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 I had a potion that a transformo juice that made me a white lady. Yeah. And what I learned is I don't want to be a white lady. I just want to be <laughs> me. <laughs> she had the worst experience as a white lady. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just want to be me, but I want to be in a space that allows me to do that without fearing my safety. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Letty is very skeptical of this arrangement. but, but As she should be. <laughs> of, of course. But before she can really get into it with Ruby, um, somebody calls from upstairs. It's like, Letty, you need to get up here. Yeah. And so we cut away from that. And we're going to kind of wrap up the D story. And then, because we do a lot of cutting back and forth, but instead of doing that, let's just finish what what's going on with D, and yeah. then we'll cut over to Letty and 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 whatnot. But so D is in this has gone to the travel guide office mm-hmm. where she is just kind of laying in wait for these. She's doing girls. she's doing the old Arnold Schwarzenegger and Predator. She's setting up all this. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Like she's yeah. locking the doors, building a fucking like, like a giant bow and arrow out of a, a, a massive tree log that she's bent on her back. But she's basically creating this one access point into the travel lodge, yeah. and then she starts drawing pictures of them to kind of catalog what it is that they are, how they look to her. Um, yeah, right. And if, if, gonna... if someone finds the body, at least they'll know <laughs> who it was. Topsy and Bobsy. <laughs> If I don't have time to get to the chopper, um, she like draws these pictures, and then as she's finishing that, that's when they arrive. But what they don't know is that um, D has played Clue before, and she knows that you can take someone out in the travel lodge with the lead pipe. Um, Dude, her <laughs> brain in pe- the these Topsy and Bobsy with this pipe is, I felt you- empowered. You know, yeah, I was just. I'm- I've never wanted a lead pipe so much in my entire life. <laughs> oh, but also, all right. So in that same sequence though, where she brains one of them, mm. there's also the other one that creeps in the side door and then looks at the audience before closing the door behind it re- her. It really, oh. really, really does. It's fucking brilliant. Oh. Absolutely brilliant. It's so I mean. weird. Anyway, so yep. Montrose hears all this commotion and finds D in in the lobby of this place swinging at the air and he just grabs her hugging her thinking yeah. hey he's like I'm she's doing to- a leather face like just like, <laughs> <laughs> right but then we see this wound on her arm start to like form and then spread yeah and we then see from her point of view one of these things just is chewing on her arm yeah. While the other one is dancing around behind Montrose. And this is the last we see of these characters. Yeah, we're cutting away from that. And I was like, oh, you son of a fucking bitch. But hopefully, episode nine, we come back to discuss that. But there are bigger things afoot. And what I can only describe as one of my favorite things I've ever seen on TV ever. It's... Um, oh, like, it's so fucking good. <laughs> like, they're, they're, like, we're going to be talking about this, but. There is a one shot of character standing against the house as a police officer flies past the house in the background. Oh. That might be one of the best things I've ever fucking seen in my entire life. Because the man shouting Letty up um, was basically giving the head up that the 5 are at the front door um, and the police have a search warrant because they are led to believe, and we know this is bullshit, that there's maybe a kind of brotherhood of Islam. Yeah, there's Muslims in the house. Yeah, yeah, p- planning some sort of retaliation for the funeral that's happened today. And of course, we know it's bullshit. The cop who's there is Lancaster. We know that's bullshit. Um, and like from kind of Ruby's perspective, she knows who this guy is because she planted the stone in that room. And she's a bit concerned for Letty, who tends to go off the 
handle anyway. And what I love about this is one cop walks in to serve this, and then Lancaster's like, "Yeah, I'm just going to walk in here," and he hits the force field. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and he turns around and obviously sees the big bloody mark on the side of the door, which was put there a few episodes ago uh, during the, the exorcism scenes for the house. Um, and he instantly realizes, well, yeah, this is my worst fear. She has achieved some sort of magical ability, um, and there is only one way in the cop book to remove magical ability, Bo. And what is that? Oh, you just line up outside the house. And, yep. and shoot until there's nothing left. Tommy gun the house to bits. Like yeah, basically it's the it's... Chicago way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in Chicago. Uh, you know, like... That's how you get Letty. <laughs> what are you prepared Cop... to do? Cop can't pass your door, you put holes in the fucking wall. Um, like, it's like literally what happens is like, <laughs> like these, they start shooting heavy into this house. Of course, all the characters... Get down on the ground. Get down. Uh, they're all down on the ground. Bullets are flying everywhere. And then there's this wonderful scene as all this is happening that Letty suddenly remembers, wait one second, <laughs> I'm invincible. So she sits up and these bullets are flying past her and then they'll get a slow motion bullet that comes towards her and basically ricochets off her. Uh, once yeah. again, this is Xena's magic. Um, and Letty kind of looks pissed. Not she, she's she's just, not happy. She is not a happy fucking woman right now. And like, yeah, this, as she sees like the the boarding house that she's built up, like the chandeliers are crashing, and mm-hmm. like everything, like everything she's been working for is destroyed. Yeah. Plus, like she doesn't know where Tech is. Yeah. And uh, this Asian woman appeared earlier on, who basically turned out to be a fuck demon. Um, you know, there's there's bullets on her house. Ruby's on the ground, she might get hurt. And oh, by the way, she's fucking pregnant as well. And they're just shooting bullets casually in here. Letty's going to get some, she's going to get up in this bitch. Uh, meanwhile, Tick's walking along the street. He's coming back from his failed, quote unquote, failed uh, magic experiment. And he hears, he hears some bullets. So he arrives. And of course, the police turn on him. Bo, oh man. Yeah, it, oh my God, this is so good. So, so good. <laughs> Tick stops. The police look at him. He looks at them. <laughs> then one cop starts to turn and says, like, get your fucking hands up. Tick does. And Letty more, sees them. Letty sees them and is like, no, and <laughs> runs out of the house. Um, As she's rushing, this is all kind of playing out in slow motion. Mm. And then you see a bullet uh, come yeah. out of the end of one of these cops. He's guns. got a gun! <laughs> Aimed at an encore performance of that line tonight. Um, <laughs> you may you may just not remember that you you said that before. It's been so long. Well, I, I, get, I get the feeling that this is... Like, I get a feeling that's what Lancaster did when he couldn't get through the door. He walked back into the, the cops and was like, she's got a gun! And that's why they all started shooting at that. <laughs> He's got a shog off! Uh, well, this is that the bullet starts coming towards Tick, and it is a ball here, nay, he cunt here away from hitting him, and then the ground explodes, and our our old buddy, the shug off, yeah. appears, and I was like, every little thing he does is magic. <laughs> every little- <laughs> yeah, and it just rolls through the cops. It is like like Letty and Tick are trying to get inside. Mm. Meanwhile. A cop flies through a window. A, a car yeah, fucking a car. lands in front of them. Yeah. And what I love about this is every time the camera pans around from where they so they're like moving, but it's a very action based cinematography. So the camera's moving around as they're going. And you just see this thing come out of a fucking car, the side of the car, grab someone, tear them apart, throw one of them out the way, camera moves back around to follow them along. Yeah. And there's a guy flies over the top of the head, a car hits the grass. Uh, the Shoggoth goes to town. Um, is right, right. This is the that confused me. Is Lancaster one of the? Is Lancaster the guy that gets his arm ripped off? Yes, Lancaster is right. the dude who gets his gun arm bitten off. Right, that's fine, but he's still alive. One presumes because we we cut from that to see a cop flying through the air, <laughs> which is really funny. But the question is, is that Lancaster? Or is that another cop? Yeah, I think he's still alive. I I would think so. I I would like yeah. to believe that Lancaster is. Alive enough, like like he'll use magic or something to come back to be kind of deformed and whatnot. But, yeah, yeah. Um, 
But it, it is so funny a visual to see this cop body just fly across the screen. Like, <laughs> like standing like, in front uh, of the house and that thing flies past him in the air, like high in the air. <laughs> it's the top one on the house. <laughs> just the way. And this thing rips them all to fucking shreds. And you've got, well, the thing is, you've got Tick and um, <laughs> Letty standing there, drenched in cop blood. Yeah. Like, there's no way you're going to be able to talk this down. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way to hide this like there's cars strewn about the place and like severed cop parts all over but the Shoggoth comes up uh, as if seemingly to attack Tick uh, Tick puts his hand out and it nuzzles his hand Yeah. oh he's a good boy he's a good <laughs> Shoggoth is literally what my pug does when I tell my pug to fucking behave as yeah. he comes up like I used to I had to stop that and he thinks that that's an invitation to be clapped and Letty has this really, like, kind of sweet, poignant line where she's like, I take it the magic word. Yeah. I guess the really spell magic. work. Um, so, and, and there endeth the episode. Uh, so, oh. here's the thing, Duncan. Oh, so good. <laughs> so, seven, uh, episode seven mm-hmm. is this kind of glorious exploration of a side character, both both literally on the show, like she is not the main character, but also a character who has lived as sort of a side character in her own life. Yeah. And it, it like that whole episode is this glorification of the, the sidekick. In yeah. The, 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 yeah. The, the ability to take the sidekick and give them a wealth of being the adventurer. Yeah. Um, and an episode like you are that you are the, the lead character in your own adventure. Uh, and we'll take you through sci-fi. We'll take you through, you know, romance and dance, and we'll take you through action. We'll take you through all these things that the, the lead would generally do that the side wouldn't get to do, and they get to live those experiences, and it's fucking amazing. Um, and then the show takes a wicked turn in episode eight and brings it all back with a bang, but like feels the need at that point to start bringing and knows it only has two episodes left, so it starts pulling all the threads together. Um, and he really satisfying way and gets bloody. <laughs> yeah, and and eight is also very much the the kind of Black Lives Matter episode. It yes, is, and, oh, very much it, as like, in the way it's. I would love to know when this was filmed. Yeah, or yeah, either it is eerily prescient because there, be. yeah, because there's that moment where D, while she's being hassled by the cops, actually has the line, "I can't breathe." Yeah, she can't. She can't breathe, which obviously has a prevalence sure. and importance just now. And um, and I think that which, a lot I mean, of this is Misha Green, like through D, being able to say "fuck you, pig," well, yeah, is, well, is cathartic. <laughs> like that is cathartic in so many ways. Yeah for this show and it, like that's kind of you know we talk about it a bunch but it's kind of the genius of the show is that all of the socio-political commentary is there and it's yeah. very much part of the show but if you wanted to ignore it you could yeah um, oh, god, oh god yeah if you I, want to only look at this show as a i kind of once again linking back to the two-dimensional view of a period horror movie uh show yeah it totally fits that brief but you don't I, you don't have to dig that far to get a, a wealth of subtext and and commentary, and I think that's where the show works at its best is the fact it can weave all that stuff in plus have this kind of very pulpy. Got the, there is the, the the cop blood that I mentioned earlier on is because Atticus and D turn their head around the car and a cop explodes in front of them, and someone off camera has a bucket of fake blood that in the throat in their faces. Yeah, and that's the that's the brilliance of this show is that you have all this weighty commentary happening there, but on the on the surface, you ultimately have a show that's dedicated to, to giving you gore and viscera and horror and and all those things that come hand in hand with it. And they do it expertly. It's another two episodes that are really a testament to phenomenal acting and amazing script writing. Um and the cinematography, like I say, Misha Green's floored me because not only is she behind the adaptation here for for the screen, but like I said before, first time director on this episode, and dear God Almighty, uh, it's just a talent that is not only able to write stories but but manifest them fully on the screen. Um, yeah, it's it's 
I would say I, I feel like we're just like repeating ourselves every week. Is he sh- is he easily the best show I've seen this year? Like easily, and I think even if they fuck up the last two episodes, I'll still be saying it's easily the best show I've seen this year. It just works on a completely different level to everything. It gives me everything I want. It is like someone finally took the idea of the X-Files Monster of the Week episodes that we all loved, but we only got like two every season and has made an entire show uh, Monster of the Week episodes, uh, but their own little spins on them and all of them work incredibly well without feeling that they're diverting too far off the central story. Everything has a purpose and we're now starting to see what that purpose is. Uh, yeah, this is absolutely... I cannot... Like, the, the willpower that had to be enacted... Yeah. Uh, not to watch episode nine after watching episode eight is Herculean. There's no way to describe it. Um, I can't wait to wrap this show up and then go back through it again. It's fucking like jaw droppingly good. Yeah, it's terrific. Uh, Duncan, let's uh, before we bounce out of here, mm-hmm. if, if people, uh, God help them, want to hear more out of you. <laughs> <laughs> we've been we've been running long. I don't think that'll happen. Yeah, uh, yeah they can check me out on podcast under the stairs. You can do that by visiting the website t cast, which is t p u t s cast dot com, or just type podcast under the stairs into whatever podcatcher you have, and I will appear there. <laughs> yeah, say his name three <laughs> times, and there he is. Uh, yeah, don't, don't but try and space it out because can't be in two places at once. I've tried. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's good to know that you obey the laws of physics. That's uh, uh, we're possible, but I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, some some rules are made to be broken. No, no question about that. Um, hey, if you want to hear any more out of me, uh, then you can find more at legionpodcasts.com, dot uh, where you can find shows like Pick Six Movies and Hero Hero Go Show and uh, a number of other projects. Uh, some standalone stuff just on the Legion Podcast main feed. Uh, so mm. check out more of that stuff over there. And uh, until next time, when we will be discussing the final two episodes of Lovecraft Country, no. uh, all uh, it is, all that is left to say is, say goodnight, Duncan. Say goodnight, Duncan. What? D- Nori. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Two weeks. Two weeks. All right, I'm pulling the plug on this. <laughs> Wait, you're broken. <laughs>